Okay. Disha, just let me know when we're good to go. We're good to go. Great. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our special planning committee meeting here, May 28th, 9 a.m. in Port Carling. The purpose of this do I need to start over again? No, okay. Technical stuff, everyone. Okay, the purpose of this special meeting today is to hold a public meeting for the Township of Muskoka Lakes Official Plan Amendment number 56. And so I'm calling this meeting to order at 9.02. I am also going to uh, verbally confirm uh, that our members of uh, council are here uh, with the exception of Councillor uh, Jaglowitz, who has sent his regrets in. And we have the clerk, the director of development services and, and environmental sustainability and other members of our staff are present. So this uh, public input has been invited to, uh, in this meeting to, uh, for, at planning at muskokalakes.ca. A number of public submissions have been received in regard to the draft Muskoka Lakes official plan amendment number 56. All of the public submissions received will be provided to council after the public meeting. Um, today's meeting is live, live uh, streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka Lakes website and YouTube channel. By participating in the open public meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice and comments being recorded and posted online. And at this point in time, we do not have a supplementary agenda. So I will move on now to any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. So I see I see uh, our CAO is with us now too. Welcome, Mr. Hammond. And um, <laughs> yeah. so um, our invited guest is Nick McDonald, who is our consultant for this new OPA. And so just to um, let you know how today is going to go. First of all, I actually want to acknowledge because this public meeting being held by, um, by Zoom, uh, our, our unsung heroes today are uh, Lauren Cochran and uh, Diksha Marwana who are running this and bringing people in and out, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I already take my hat off to them because normal planning meetings, it's, it's a chore. So I think they're on their toes today and I think we're good to go. Uh, so today we're going to have Mr. McDonald uh, start us off. Uh, he has a slide presentation and Mr. Pink may have some comments after that. Probably, well, maybe not, we'll see. And then I'll, I'll say a, a few brief words and then we will get to public input. I do want to let everybody know that this meeting today is to hear from you. We are not having discussions. There will not be comments. Um, this council is not making decisions. Uh, this is strictly a draft and we need the public input before we start to discuss uh, what actually will go into this OPA. So we've worked hard on this. So we got it to the point where we felt we could send it out to you for comment. And that's where we sit today. So I think without further ado, Mr. McDonald, welcome, and uh, don't you take it away. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Bridgman. Uh, my name is uh, Nick McDonald. I'm a registered professional planner, and I've been asked by the Township of Muskoka Lakes to provide advice and assistance uh, with respect to this official plan amendment. Uh, there is a slideshow that will be put on screen shortly, I'm assuming, Lauren, and I'll be following that along. That slideshow was also made available in advance and is also available on the township's website as well. So I will be going through that momentarily. I'll just wait for the uh, slideshow to start and then I will get going. Great. Thank you very much. So we'll go to the next slide. So the purpose of the public meeting today, as mentioned, is to present uh, the draft official plan amendment and provide members of the public with the ability to ask questions and provide opinions on the merits of the draft official plan amendment. 
No decisions will be made at this public meeting. Uh, all comments written in oral will be considered and addressed in a future report to council, along with a recommendation from me. The timing of this future report is not known at this time. Next slide, please. So this is a fairly uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, I will be spending a bit of time uh, talking about history uh, and how we got here before I even get into unpacking the draft official plan amendment. Uh, that really is the purpose of today. But because there is so much history, uh, it is my belief that it is useful for all of us to have a common understanding of it, uh, to know where we need to go and where we could be going in the future with the planning for this key area of Muskoka Lakes. So within this presentation, I'll be providing a, an overview of the current in effect official plan policies that apply. I will talk briefly about the in effect zoning that also applies in this area. Uh, I'll also briefly mention the interim control bylaw that was passed in 2018 and its implications on the process and how we got here. I will review the products of the work completed by the steering committee uh, and the minute working group uh, that was formed following the, the disbanding of the steering committee. And then lastly, I will talk about the proposed official plan amendment in terms of its purpose and effect. Next slide. Starting at the beginning, um, thankfully it's only 2005 or else we'd be here for a very long time. Um, so in 2005, applications to amend the district and township plans were first uh, submitted. And at that time, Minette was identified as a community in both the district and township official plans. And this means at the time of the application, Minette was considered to be a settlement area. And I should note that it continues to be identified as such. Along with the applications to amend the two official plans, the applicants also initiated a concurrent Municipal Class Environmental Assessment EA process. And that process concluded that full municipal services was the most appropriate and viable option for development of the lands in Minette. The planning applications at the time were supported by a number of reports, including the planning report, a stormwater management report, a review of transportation, economic assessment, an environmental study report, and a financial impact assessment. The primary purpose of the official plan amendments at that time was to permit the development of a master plan resort village on full municipal services with phase one on private communal services and phase two on full municipal services. Next slide. The public meeting on the original applications was held on July 4th, 2006, with a second public meeting held on September 16th, 2006. And on January 30th of 2007, Township Council adopted Official Plan Amendment 34. And then on May 7th, 2007, District Council adopted OPA 31 to the District's Official Plan. And also on that same date, approved the Township's Official Plan Amendment. Both Official Plan Amendments were appealed in June of 2007. And the settlement was reached amongst the parties that resulted in a slight reduction in the density of development that would be permitted. It was around 10 units per acre. And we recognize that the current version of the official plan in effect still permits 12 units per acre and this is recognized. There's a long story behind that um, and I'm happy to get into it, but it's not really relevant at this point. On March 7th, 2008, uh, the Ontario Municipal Board approved both official plan amendments. Next slide. So in terms of what OPA 34 did, uh, it set out a number of objectives. Firstly, the official plan amendments, both at the district and township level, defined Minette as a resort village that permitted four season recreational resort uses, related commercial activities and residential uses in recognition of Minette being a settlement area. The objectives of the township as set out in official plan amendment 34 were intended to do a number of things, recognize Minette's historic tourist commercial character, encourage development that would contribute to the success of the community, foster the development and expansion of tourist resorts in Minette, create employment and other opportunities, encourage the development of a range of housing options, provide for appropriate servicing and protect environmentally sensitive areas. I should note when, I, when I'm talking about OPA 34, I'm actually talking about the policies that are currently in effect, just to be clear. Next slide. 
So OPA 34 did a number of things. And in addition to adding policy, it also added a number of designations into, uh, sorry, schedules into the official plan. So this is schedule J1, and it established the residential designation, uh, which was in yellow, uh, the village core designation, which st uh, stretched along Judd Haven Road around Wallace Bay, the resort commercial designation, uh, which is the large pink area that extended to the east and to the north, a wetland designation that recognized the two wetland areas that exist in Minette, and an institutional designation. There were two areas designated as such, one applied to the fire hall and community center on Judd Haven, and the other applied uh, at the north part, at the north end of Minette for, uh, to the area that was proposed to be the site of the sewage treatment plant. Next slide. In terms of permissions, uh, there were a number of permissions established. Uh, by OPA 34 and again which are in the current official plan. So with respect to the residential designation, a variety of densities and housing types were permitted including both resort units and staff accommodation. Within the village core designation uh, that was the area which was intended to be the major focus uh, of development in Minette with a planned main street and a wide variety and a range of uses were permitted as a consequence. The resort commercial designation permitted resort commercial development and residential uses, provided residential uses did not exceed 50% of the total units permitted. Uh, other policies, other notable policies included uh, one where public use of resort facilities was encouraged. The wetland designation recognized the wetland area at the end of Wallace Bay and the other wetland I identified. And then the institutional designation as mentioned uh, I uh, applied to the community center fire hall and the proposed sewage treatment plan. Next slide. A uh, second schedule was added into the official plan and that was scheduled J1A. Uh, and that essentially was a servicing plan for Minette. It established a full service area, uh, which was the area in pink or purple um, and a future service area. Uh, future service area would eventually be uh, on full municipal services and really the effect of this schedule was to establish the phasing of the establishment of services in Minette. Next slide. So this is a key schedule that has been uh, reviewed and looked at uh, by a number of parties and this is a density schedule for want of a better word and this is schedule J1B. So what this schedule did is it divided uh, the Minette area into six areas plus the non-red leaves area which was uh, to the south and west and the non-red leaves area was an area not controlled or owned uh, by the folks that were behind Minette at the time. So what happened is within each of these areas a uh, an area calculation was derived and then a density was applied to each. So for example area one at an area of 84 acres and the density is 25 units per acre. And area one generally applied to the village core area, not exactly uh, aligning with it, but generally in the same location. Area two uh, was in two different areas. Uh, again, 23 acres and nine acres, 10 units per acre and so on. So in at the end, uh, there was a total of 543 acres uh, included on this schedule. Um, and the average density was 10 units per acre. Next slide. So in terms of what this meant uh, within areas one to six, uh, which had an area of about 403 acres. And when you do the math, uh, it ends up meaning that up to 4,242 units could be developed on the lands. And that works out to about uh, 10.5 units per acre. The non-red leaves lands, uh, were, which were the lands to the west I mentioned, they had an area of about 158 acres, but there was no density assigned, although it was in a future service area. The total land area was about and is about 561 acres. Next slide. A number of appendices were also attached to the official plan. Appendices are not a formal part of a, an official plan, but they are illustrative and can assist in its interpretation. And three or actually four appendices were added, appendices one, 2A, 2B, and 2C. And I've included uh, an extract from one of those appendices on this particular slide. So what these appendices did 
is it established a very detailed phasing plan that was intended to implement the master plan uh, that was presented at the time. This phasing plan had over 40 different components um, that set out what the densities uh, were in each area and when those areas were expected to be built out. The build out at the time was expected to be 2026. The total number of units identified on this phasing plan uh, was 2,858. A commercial floor area of 58,000 square feet was also included. Uh, an area of 149,000 was set aside for resort uh, functional floor areas. Um, and given that 2,858 units were proposed um, and that was less than the over 4,000 that was permitted by the official plan, uh, this, this plan certainly did not provide for the full build out or the full uh, realization of the density permissions in the official plan. A new road network was also proposed. Uh, for example, a road was proposed to connect a Peninsula Road with Juthaven Road so that there was more connectivity in the area. Um, and I also note the phasing plan did not deal with the non-red leaves land, which is a common thing through all of this. Next slide. So after official plan amendment 34 was in effect and approved by the Ontario Municipal Board, uh, discussions were initiated uh, between the district and the proponent regarding the provision of municipal services. And these discussions have not been concluded as of today. In 2013, uh, the district passed a resolution directing the district to enter into agreements with the proponent and the Ontario Clean Water Agency respecting the design, construction and operation of municipal services uh, however, agreements have not been entered into and those works have not been constructed. Uh, on February 14th, 2017, uh, an application was received by the township to rezone certain lands to implement an updated concept plan uh, for the properties. The application was received but not deemed complete by the township and it is my understanding that that file is considered to be closed uh, by the township. On September 18th of 2017, an environmental compliance approval was obtained by the province uh, from the province uh, for phase one uh, of the new for the new sewage works and this approval would serve the development that existed at the time essentially to jw marriott and a few other things along with minor expansions and redevelopment uh, the environmental compliance approval uh, requires that a responsibility agreement be entered into with the district this agreement has not been entered into and those works have not been constructed either next slide In 2018, uh, about 1,200 acres in the resort village and area was sold by Ken Fowler Enterprises to a private company. On May 18th of 2018, uh, Interim Control Bylaw 2018-66 was passed by Township Council. The effect of that Interim Control Bylaw was essentially to freeze development until a more fulsome review of the planning permissions that existed could be undertaken. Uh, that interim control bylaw was extended in May of 2019 and it eventually expired on July 17th of 2020. So there is no interim control bylaw in effect today. Soon after the interim control bylaw passed, uh, the Manette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee, uh, in short MJPRSC, was established. And I won't be repeating that, I'll be just saying Steering Committee from here on in. That's a very long acronym. Uh, the steering committee met on multiple occasions, uh, commissioned two studies and presented uh, their final recommendations to the township in June of 2020. And following this, the, uh, with their mandate concluded, the steering committee was formally disbanded by both township and district councils. Next slide. So the steering committee made a, made a number of recommendations. And I would note that the recommendations were were identified as being majority recommendations, meaning that not all folks on the steering committee uh, uh, agreed with what was being recommended. However, given the role of the steering committee, I, I felt it was important to uh, go through their recommendations fairly briefly so that there is an understanding of what uh, was recommended and where there were uh, disputes or uh, non-agreement with those recommendations. So as I mentioned, there were 25 of them. 
Um, so recommendation one dealt with the function and role of Minette, um, and there seemed to be agreement that it would be a tourist and recreation focused area. Uh, recommendations two to seven established a number of goals and objectives, primarily dealing with the environment and the protection of it. Uh, recommendation eight set out permitted land uses, uh, and they included, of course, tourist commercial uses, uh, staff accommodations, uh, single detached only, in areas zoned for residential use. Um, there was uh, no uh, agreement on that uh, from, from all members of the steering committee. Uh, steer, uh, recommendation number nine dealt with character. So they recommended a maximum height of 13.7 meters. Uh, impacts on topography should be minimized and a 30 meter buffer from shoreline from the shoreline was also recommended. Uh, I also note that there was not full agreement on that either. Uh, with respect to height and the buffers from the shoreline. Uh, recommendations 10 and 11 dealt with access and transportation. And in essence, development should take capacity of surrounding roads into account and cap number of new docking at 20% of existing. And again, uh, not all were in agreement on this point and some believe that the road and bridge infrastructure needed, uh, needed to be upgraded uh, before anything can happen uh, within Minette. Next slide. Recommendations 12 and 13 uh, dealt with servicing and stormwater, um, essentially uh, requiring that climate change be taken into account. Uh, shoreline buffer should be retained uh, with private servicing um, being preferred. And again, uh, some members felt that full municipal services was the better way to go. However, the majority view uh, was that private services be preferred. A recommendation 14 uh, dealt with employment, uh, indicated that employment opportunities should be provided, staff accommodations should also be provided on site. I think there was agreement on that. Uh, recommendations 15 and 16 dealt with the environment, uh, maintain and improve the environmental features that existed. Again, reference to the 30 meter shoreline buffer, the need for a tree protection plan, and the desire for lead buildings to be constructed. Uh, 17 and 18 dealt with wetlands and fish habitat and essentially indicated that development should be prohibited in those areas. Uh, recommendation 19 um, dealt with constraints, uh, indicated no development should be permitted on knolls, uh, vegetation to be retained on steeper slopes, and only minor modifications to topography were permitted. Next slide. So number 20 dealt with density and the recommendation from the steering committee uh, was that 2 million square feet uh, be permitted uh, with Minette, which includes 1,021 units recommended at densities ranging from 1.25 to 4.5 units per hectare. I noticed this slide uh, when I reviewed it this morning, it says hectare, that should say acre. Um, so that's a correction I'd like to make right now. Uh, please note as well uh, that, that those densities are clearly less uh, than what uh, OPA um, uh, 34 currently uh, permits. Um, I'll get back to some of these numbers in a moment. Uh, recommendation 21 talked about the need for community benefits and the need for agreement on parkland dedications along with meaningful public input into that process. Uh, recommendation 22 and 23 dealt with implementation uh, there was a need for phasing provisions, uh, a need for a comprehensive development plan and environmental management guidelines um, and, and for all of those to be completed before development was initiated. And then a number of definitions were also suggested, uh, including residence primary and seasonal, resort commercial accommodation unit, et cetera. Detailed provisions on occupancy and turnover were also recommended. And in this regard, it was 26 weeks owner occupied of which four weeks can be between June 15th through September 15th. Next slide. So a number of studies were also uh, uh, commissioned uh, by the steering committee. Uh, well, not a number, but two studies were commissioned by the steering committee. And one was the waterfront economy study. And essentially the purpose of the study was to estimate the size, economic contribution and future growth prospects of resorts, cottages, homes and short-term rentals. And this table came from uh, the work completed by the steering committee. This table is not in the actual study prepared by Altus Consulting, uh, but basically is a summary of, of their work. And what this table does 
is it identifies a number of different metrics uh, that were looked at by Altus Consulting. And then it looked at the uh, economic uh, impact uh, of seasonal cottages, resorts, year-round residences, and short-term rentals. And as you can see, uh, in all cases, the economic impact from seasonal co cottages is significant um, and more uh, than the economic impact that come from resorts. Year-round residences uh, end up being in third place um, and with short-term rentals uh, being at the bottom. I think the point here was that there was a significant impact and role that seasonal cottages play uh, in the economy of the district. And that, that certainly was recognized by Altus Consulting. For the economic activity character, uh, category, just to put some numbers to this, uh, seasonal cottages generated about $925 million in economic activity uh, in the district, while the resorts generated about $591 million in economic activity. Next slide. Uh, the consultant retained also concluded uh, the following. Uh, so they reviewed uh, 32 resorts and they determined uh, that they accommodated 521,000 visitor night stays. Uh, the own use of private seasonal cottage owners and their guests was 1.6 million visitor night stays. Short-term rentals were only 290,000 uh, room nights. Uh, by 2046, the consultants indicated that there will be a need to accommodate an additional 2.5 million additional person night stays in the district. Uh, with and out of that number, night stays at resorts were projected to increase by about 658,000 by 2046. They translated that night stays number into about 270 net new four season resort rooms being needed in the district to meet uh, the expected demand that they've identified. In terms of where all the other night stays are coming from, they indicated that they would, for the most part, be uh, established or created in the short term rental sector. Next slide. The second study commission was a study of voting impacts uh, primarily on, on Wallace Bay, but it also looked at the, at the Joseph River and Fort Sandfield. So the purpose of the study was to review voting usage and activity in Wallace Bay during uh, key summer weekends. Uh, the study compared uh, um, traffic from 2008 and looked at two new areas, as I mentioned, Joseph River and Fort Sandfield. And based on the methodology selected by the consultants, uh, it was determined that Wallace Bay regularly exceeds available boating capacity. And however, this was the case only on long weekends on the Joseph River and Port Sandfields. In other words, Wallace Bay did exceed capacity um, for most of the times reviewed. Uh, the consultants, however, could not draw any causational conclusions regarding boating congestion and safety as it relates to the number of resort units or overall development in the net area. However, the steering committee did recommend on the basis of this study and their own experience uh, that no more than 20, there should be no more than a 20% increase in dockage permitted, uh, no matter what happens uh, in Minette going forward. Next slide. So I wanted to get back to the numbers. So. The final steering committee recommendations uh, were, are, were that 863 uh, units be permitted uh, within Minette. Uh, that's less than the 1021 I mentioned on a previous slide. That's because the 1021 included 158 units on the non-red uh, non leaves lands. Um, so the 863 uh, would be on the, uh, the balance of the lands of Minette. And this compares, of course, to the 4,242 units that could be permitted based on the density permissions on Schedule J1 of the current official plan, which again, I note, does not include the non-red leaves lands. The number of waterfront units recommended by the steering committee uh, was 606, and this compares to the 2,690 that could be permitted, again, based on the density permissions on Schedule 1 of the current official plan. The number of non-waterfront units recommended by the steering committee was 257, and that compares to the 1,552 units that could be permitted based on the current density permissions in the official plan. So as you can see, the steering committee numbers were significantly less uh, than what is currently permitted by the official plan. I'll come back to numbers in a little bit uh, because we have newer numbers established by the OPA to review as well. Next slide. 
So following the uh, disbanding of the steering committee, uh, Muskoka Lakes Council decided to establish a working group made up of representatives of the steering committee, the mayor and chair of planning committee, uh, property owners and the district of Muskoka. This working group met many times to develop a draft official plan amendment with the final meeting of this group being held on August 5th of 2020. It was indicated in the documentation uh, that came out of that process that consensus could not be reached on a number of items, including density, number of units and floor space, how Minette should be classified, should it be a resort village, should it be a hamlet, should it be a special policy area. Uh, no consensus was reached on servicing. There was still a strong belief uh, felt uh, held by many that private services was the way to go. Others felt that public services was more appropriate. Uh, the grandfathering of setbacks from the shoreline and how that should be dealt with. And that had to do with some folks wanting a 30 meter setback for all new development and others not wanting that 30 meter setback and some recognition of existing permissions. And then there was uh, no consensus on the definitions of unit owner and gross floor area uh, as, as well. Next slide. So a, a draft official plan amendment was produced at the conclusion of the Minette Working Group process. And on August 31st, 2020, uh, Town of Muskoka, the Township of Muskoka Lakes Council received the draft official plan amendment prepared by Travis and Associates, basically Colin Travis, who was retained jointly by the district and the township to participate in the working group process. Um, the official plan amendment built upon the steering committee recommendations from January 2020 that I just reviewed and the discussions uh, by the Minette Working Group. However, the draft official plan amendment did not implement all of the steering committee recommendations. And in this regard, Mr. Travis indicated the following, and I thought this was important uh, to understand how uh, the official plan amendment has evolved through the process. So he said that this means that proposed policies, although reflecting for the most part a consensus of the working group and the professional planning opinion, they will be subject to additional review by prescribed agencies on the general public. And admittedly, there are instances where agreeing with a working group position was difficult to reconcile from a professional planning opinion point of view. We note that such instances did, re did reflect the working group consensus and seeking consensus was the primary objective of the working group process. So clearly, um, Mr. Travis, when looking at all of the information and discussion that ensued, uh, he made a judgment call on what the official plan amendment should look like based on his professional planning opinion. Next slide. So the draft official plan amendment prepared by Mr. Travis would permit uh, 1,999 units. And this would be in addition to the JW Marriott and the legacy uh, sites, uh, which meant that the overall total number of units was 2,319. So this number came from uh, the major landowner. Uh, within Minette, uh, and this was a proposal they made to the working group, and Mr. Travis included this proposal uh, within his draft official plan amendment. The draft official plan amendment also indicated that while private communal services be the method of servicing, uh, Mr. Travis indicated that it was a difficult land use planning recommendation. In other words, it was difficult for him to support that as a planner, uh, because both provincial policy and district policy uh, very much strongly, very strongly encourage and require uh, public services, particularly when residential uses of this scale are proposed. So in order to implement private commercial services, sorry, private communal services in Manette, an amendment to the district official plan would have been required. And given the need for the amendment, district staff determined that direction from district council would be required before considering this divergence in their approach to servicing uh, in the district. And so on November 19th of 2020, a comprehensive district staff report was prepared and dealt with, um, and the issue of private communal, com private communal services was uh, also dealt with, and it was concluded and directed uh, that major residential or mixed use development would not be supported on private communal services. So that meant full services would be the only way to go uh, for development of this scale. Next slide. 
So we finally get to official plan amendment number 56, which is really what the purpose of this meeting is all about and, and for, for which we're looking for public input on. So official plan amendment 56, um, the purpose of it is to revise the resort village designation and the associated land use, environmental, transportation, servicing, and other policies for Manette. Uh, the official plan amendment also establishes and permits a variety of densities and land uses. It also establishes the long-term role and function of the resort village in the context of the overall growth and development uh, in the township and the district. It's also intended to establish a clear policy direction based on council's vision on the nature, scale, and location of the full development of the Minette Resort Village. And lastly, it was it is intended to replace Section C1 in its entirety um, with new policies. The existing schedules would all be deleted and replaced with new ones. And the previous appendices that I went through that identified a previous master plan uh, would also be deleted. I was the primary author of OPA 56. I took Mr. Travis's official plan amendment and I improved it in certain areas uh, to better reflect what I thought it should be saying. Um, but for the most part, it is based on the proposal uh, that was uh, submitted uh, or uh, I guess given to the township by the major landowner uh, within Minette. Next slide. So in terms of what uh, Minette Resort Village is, official plan amendment 56 establishes that by defining it. And it is a resort village. It's a planned community in which the focus of use is centered around four season tourist commercial, recreational resort and related commercial activities. Supplemental residential uses are permitted. The form and function of growth or change shall respect the history and character of the existing community. So what this is saying is that the focus is really tourism commercial and recreational. However, residential uses are permitted. It is a settlement area and that's why that is the case. Next slide. So in terms of designations, a number of designations are created by official plan amendment 56 and they include uh, the village core designation at the top end of uh, Wallace Bay. It's much smaller than the previous village core designation that existed. There is an environmental wetland designation that applies to the two wetland areas that were previously identified. Institutional designation applies to the Fire Hall Community Center. And then there are three residential designations, one uh, which essentially permits existing development um, and the other two, which are in the yellow and orange um, on both sides of Judd Haven Road, where primarily residential uses would be permitted although there would be permissions for resort accommodation units uh, as well in those areas, but that's where the residential uses would be directed. And then there are four uh, separate resort commercial uh, designations uh, also established as well. And then the non red leaves area is identified in brown and that's on the west side or the left hand side of that map. And I'll go through what these designations permit in the next slides, next slide. So numbers, um, because numbers are important and it's certainly the, the numbers certainly have been the focus of conversation over the last little while. So what OPA 56 does, uh, it permits uh, a maximum gross floor area in the village core resort commercial one and resort commercial two designations of about 70,000 square meters or about 750 thousand square feet and includes all uses and this is considered to be a foundational element. I've underlined foundational on this slide because one of the things I did uh, in the official plan amendment that was different than what Mr. Travis had in his version was I made it very clear uh, that what was being proposed was for the full build out of Minette. So there was no dispute or uh, or potential dispute about changes that could be made in the future that would increase the amount of development or increase the densities that were being established by OPA 56. So essentially, I wanted to ensure that whatever council eventually approved represented a full build out of Minette and would not provide for anything in excess of that. If, if the landowner or a landowner in the future wished to change any of these foundational numbers, 
they would have to amend the official plan and provide the appropriate justification. I thought that was an important, uh, an important uh, uh, policy that needed to be added um, to the amendment, and I continue to believe that it is appropriate to do that. Um, so the, in terms of numbers and going back to them, uh, the maximum number of units permitted uh, in the village core and the resort commercial one and two designations was 882. This is a foundational element. Uh, there would be a need uh, as per the amendment to prepare a development phasing plan to identify the sequencing of development of resort related uses and amenities, resort commercial accommodation units and resort related uses. And in this regard, thresholds would have to be established uh, and then complied with as development occurred. Essentially, the idea here is that the resort amenities uh, have to be developed, uh, sorry, the re any residential uh, uses can only be developed in lockstep with any other of the resort amenities or resort commercial amenities that may also be proposed at the time. Um, that was a clear, uh, that's the clear direction being established by this official plan amendment. The maximum gross floor area permitted in the residential one and residential two designations, these are the areas um, to the, generally to the west of Judd Haven Road, is about 88,000 square meters, about 950 square feet. This is also foundational. And then the maximum number of units permitted in these same designations is 1,117, also foundational. For the resort commercial three and four, uh, this applies to the JW Marriott and the legacy cottages. There was recognition, or this, there is recognition in the amendment that those uses exist, and they have in total about 320 units. So that means 1,999 units, new units, plus the 320, and that's how you get to 2,319. So again, this compares to the 4,242 units that could be permitted based on the density permissions on schedule J1 of the current official plan. And this compares again to the 2,858 units shown in the appendices to the official plan. And then this also compares to the 863 units, uh, which represents the majority recommendation made uh, by the steering committee. Uh, clearly some differences of opinion uh, on what the numbers could be. Next slide. So in terms of designations themselves, uh, the vill village core and resort commercial areas, uh, you see the resort commercial one, two, three, uh, and four, plus the village core on this map. Uh, this is really intended to be the focus of the net, not really that much different uh, than the current official plan. Uh, however, the boundaries are different. Um, so with respect to the village core, it is intended to be the primary gathering place in the, in the net. Uh, the resort commercial accommodation uses are permitted along with retail and service commercial uses, uh, uses that promote wellness activities and recreation opportunities and private leisure clubs. The number of resort related residential dwelling units cannot exceed 30% of the total units in these three designations. And a resort related residential dwelling unit is a unit that is functionally related to the resort, but does not need to be in a rental pool. So it can be occupied on a full-time basis uh, by the unit owner, uh, and it does not need to be rented out as do the other units uh, within this area. Um, the number of resort-related uh, residential dwelling units cannot exceed 30% of the total units. And as mentioned, uh, they can only be developed in lockstep with other uses, and they cannot exceed 30% of the units at any time in the, in the sequencing of development in this area. In addition, resort-related residential units are not permitted until an appropriate amount of resort commercial accommodation units have been established. So in other words, they can't go first, they have to go second, third, or fourth uh, with other things happening first. Densities and heights will be the highest uh, in the village core. However, the draft official plan amendment does not specify this. And in my view, there should be some clarity on that point. And I understand a few folks have raised that as an issue. And certainly we're looking forward to doing that and, and identifying what those maximum heights are uh, in a future draft of this document. Next slide. Uh, the residential designations, those are the, that's the yellow and the orange, the R2 on this slide. Uh, so lodges and resorts, hotels, cabins, lakefront villages, housekeeping and staff accommodations are permitted 
a wide range of housing forms are permitted uh, with higher densities uh, being permitted in the R1 along Judd Haven with lower densities permitted in behind. Next slide. So docking, um, so approximately 215 existing and approved boat slips uh, on the principal commercial properties in Minette uh, exist at the present time. Uh, not all of them actually physically exist, some are approved. I understand the number of approved slips is 95 or so. Uh, the official plan amendment does not permit any additional boat slips until uh, boating capacity and recreational capacity studies are completed. So that's different uh, than what was recommended by the steering committee, which recommended or indicated essentially that up to a 20% increase could be considered. The official plan amendment does not include that permission. It basically says that further study and work is required before any additional docks beyond the 215 can be considered. Uh, the official plan amendment also indicates that owners and users of island cottages will be afforded the ability to rent a boat slip enabling access to the lake and providing a semi-permanent space for boat docking. Slips will be made available for the transit use of lake cottagers, enabling access to village core amenities and wellness center. In other words, folks wanting to visit the, the village and go to a restaurant and then go back to their cottage. Uh, docks will be utilized on a limited basis for the commercial activities of the Cleveland's House Resort. Uh, limited basis will need to be defined through the implementing zoning bylaw or appropriate agreements. And then a limited number of docks may be rented on an overnight basis to members of the traveling and vacationing public, which would not include the unit owners. And then no more than 10% of the docks are to be reserved for the unit owners themselves. Next slide. There are a number of other elements uh, in the official plan amendment, a few have already mentioned. Uh, so firstly, if any of the foundational elements are proposed to be changed, an official plan amendment is required. Um, and uh, if, if that was to occur, uh, the application would have to be justified in relation to uh, population and housing targets that may be in effect and would, be, uh, would also need to be supported by a market study. A few other key elements as well. Uh, this is a policy document that will require uh, quite a bit of thought through the implementation process, uh, including an update to the zoning that applies in this area. But in addition to that, there would be a need for a master development agreement, uh, which would deal with a number of things. This master development agreement would include a master concept plan, identifying the location, nature and scale of proposed development. Uh, a development phasing plan would be a part of that. A master servicing plan identifying existing and proposed sanitary water and stormwater management facilities would also have to be completed. An integrated transportation plan uh, identifying existing and proposed integrated public, private, and condominium road networks is needed. A trails master plan identifying existing and proposed trails and trail connectivity systems is required. Architectural design guidelines uh, would also be needed and other matters deemed appropriate by township staff. So a lot still needs to be done. Um, I anticipate and see a lot of that needing to be done before the township would be prepared to consider rezoning. Um, and this is my opinion, any or all part of the, of the Minette Resort Village. Uh, so in other words, the township would need to be satisfied that all of these things have been done and are satisfactory before development that is provided for by this amendment could be actually implemented. Next slide. Official plan amendment also deals with the turnover availability of units um, and the rules below um, that I'll go through in a moment uh, would apply to the resort commercial accommodation units only. So not the straight residential use units and not the resort related residential units. So uh, about 617 units would be uh, subject to these rules in the village core resort commercial one and the resort commercial two uh, designations. Um, and up to 265 units in the village core resort commercial one and resort commercial two could be resort related residential units and they would not be subject to these rules. The 1,017 units, 1,117 units in the residential one and residential two two designations would also not be subject to these rules and neither would JW, Marriott and Legacy, which already have their own permissions and, and rules that apply. 
So the proposed rules that would apply to about 600 units out of the total um, maximum owner occupancy would be 26 weeks in the calendar year and up to four weeks in July and August. That's slightly different than what the steering committee uh, recommended. Uh, minimum seven uh, consecutive days in the summer. No minimum owner occupancy can be rented all year. The owner may exceed 26 weeks of reservation not made more than seven days in advance. And of course, if the resort or any component of it is not open year round, all of the numbers get adjusted uh, so that the same thresholds uh, also apply. Next slide. So that's the end of my presentation, uh, Chair Bridgman. I know there's a lot there and I'm sure lots of folks wants to, want to ask questions or provide comments. And I will obviously uh, be available to answer questions as required. Thank you very much, Chair Bridgman. Thank you, Mr. McDonald, for that very thorough uh, review. And I know the questions and comments, and I might say that we certainly could have people writing in to uh, us uh, to give their opinions, which we will make sure we'll go over to Mr. McDonald. And so I just have a few comments before we go, and I wonder if we could screen share again and bring up the chart, which I believe is page 42 or 43 of the of the um, package. Okay, so for those of us who liked math way better than English, I, uh, I really like this chart because to me, it gives a direct, um, very, very concise uh, what we are dealing with. And I want to reconfirm that, that your current council uh, didn't create any of this. We are dealing with, with, with the density um, of this, of Manette and, and understand the sentiment that is there. So what we're really trying to do is bring the density down, understanding that we cannot unilaterally take away um, property rights. So this chart actually gives you the snapshot of what there is now, what has been re uh, recommended by our steering committee and what the draft OPA has. This is the snapshot in time. This is where we had got to before we wanted to bring it out to the public for your, for your comments. Um, so uh, in you can see the differences. I'm not going to go through all of it. The only thing I might mention is in terms of heights of building, the working group didn't ever get to discussing that. And in terms of staff housing, um, we didn't get there either. It was lots to talk about. So I don't want you to interpret silent as discussed and nothing done. So just, just to clarify that. Uh, the other in the docking, I'm not sure, Mr. McDonald, um, I just wanted to, um, to, I think, probably clarify that the steering committee wanted a 20% increase of actual docks that are in existence now uh, as of May 2018, rather than um, anything beyond the 215 slips. So I'm sure they're going to clarify that. I think it was about 144 slips, but I know in their presentation, they will do that. So once again, I just want um, wanted everybody to see this because I think it really highlights where we are now officially, um, what's been recommended, and and what has been worked with with the uh, with the major landowner, Imanet, who has agreed to bring down a lot of these um, <clears throat> these uh, property rights um, to uh, more in line with what the community would like. So we are going to switch now to the public meeting part of this and. Uh, anybody wishing to speak on behalf of this is welcome to speak. I'm going to ask for a limit of five minutes, and I would I would really appreciate it because we are anticipating a fair number of people speaking. That we um, a be concise and b if somebody has already mentioned something, if you could just say I confirm that or whatever, and we could move on. Uh, that would be lovely. Uh, at the end of each speaker, we will be asking the committee if they have any questions, their clarification questions. As I mentioned before, we're not debating today. We're not discussing today. We were si simply intaking what you have to say. 
So I believe, and then at the end of this, uh, there will be a direction to staff um, to to bring back those re recommendations, and that will be Mr. McDonald who who does that. So I think without further ado, um, if we could bring in Ms. Bustard. And so this is going to take a little bit of time, but um, Paula represents the owners of Cleveland's House, who are a major part of this. So we'd like to hear from, from Ms. Bustard, and then we'll carry on with the rest. Welcome, Paula. Thank you very much, Chair Bridgman and uh, Mayor Harding and members of Council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today, and I thank Mr. McDonald for his very thorough and detailed presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a very brief presentation. Um, oh, uh, am I able to get permissions to share? It's disabled right now. Um, the clerk is able to do that. Um, I will start. So, Paula, could you forward it to David? Oh, uh, yes. I and, and David will share it. We're we're not doing any screen sharing out of um, um, staff members today. No problem. I will send it to him right now. I apologize for the delay. Um, yeah, uh, Matt on my team will send it to David right now. And in the meantime, I will uh, just keep that started. So thank you very much for your time. I think I, I won't reiterate a lot of the, the policy discussions that Mr. McDonald just went through. I will just uh, say that it, it has been a pleasure to work with, uh, with the broader community, with the steering committee, with the working group, and, and with yourselves over the last couple of years. As you know, we purchased a property in 2018. Uh, with, the, with the sole intention to obviously bring forward a, you know, a balanced and, and thoughtful design for the site and to mitigate impacts of overdevelopment of it. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, I, I think specifically in the last six months about the unit count and, and the density. And I think that obviously has continuously been probably the most contentious item. But I will reiterate uh, the one component that Mr. McDonald specified. We really have very enthusiastically and willingly come to the table to reduce the density by over 50% of what's existing. Um, and that was not an arduous task. It's something that we from day one sat around the table and, and kind of agreed to. There's obviously a lot of minutia that we continue to work through, um, but it's not just a, a matter of that, that unit count number. There's also a lot of other policies, including unit equivalencies, the use provisions, um, docking provisions, uh, setbacks, environmental sustainability. There's a, there's a whole litany of policies that we have quite willingly worked on because we do feel that the policy framework that's being brought forward is balanced and appropriate and will have uh, allow for the revitalization of Cleveland's house. The property itself has a very, very rich history, um, but it is in, uh, you know, not a great state now. It's well past its prime. We want to invest in it. We want to bring it back to the glory of what it could be. Um, and we want to have a forward thinking vision for it. Uh, but I think it is important to remember that the official plan does have to have some flexibility in it to allow for creative design, holistic design. And I think something else Mr. McDonald brought forward, uh, which I, I wholeheartedly agree with, is the fact that the zoning application and site plan application will have a lot of details, which will provide more um, more technical analysis for the city to review. And this is not the end of any process. The OPA is one component of policy. We will then be coming in with site-specific zoning applications and site plan applications uh, for the totality of, of the development. Um, and we have a lot of existing legal rights on the property uh, that exist. And as I said, we've willingly come to the table to reduce those by over 50%. And the legal entitlements that run with it is not something that we've been fiercely defending. We've been actually trying to work to, to modify them and to curb them to find a balanced approach. Um, so with that, if, if, and I apologize, I didn't send the presentation ahead of time. Um, I, I just want to show you our vision plan and walk through um, just a couple of the components of what we're presenting. But I can assure you, we want to continue to work with the community and to work with yourselves through the rezoning application and, uh, and to bring forward a development that we can all be proud of. Uh, thank you, David. I think we just go to the next slide. And I will be brief because I know we're coming up on our five minutes. As I said, I know that there's a rich culture and natural history of the site. Uh, we are very proud of the history of the site. We wanna honor it. We can go to the next slide, David. I think some of this we've spoken to. Really looking at the past, really revitalizing the site and bringing it back to uh, what it could be. Can you keep going? Um, yeah, we can keep going, David. Thank you. 
What I want to make clear is what we are not. I know there's a lot of concern about unit numbers. We are not what the previous proposal was. We are not proposing uh, to maximize development on the site and to fit in as many units as possible. If we can go to the next site, our vision plan, which has been presented over the last year and a half at various forums, is a you know well thought out wellness, health, fitness, a porosity of open space, accessibility to the lake, um, environment first, at setbacks, obviously creating a litany of trails through the property. Uh, really, it has been a thoughtful design that we brought forward. We have not made a formal application at this point because we really wanted to work collaboratively with everyone through the design process of the OPA. If we go to the next slide. Uh, and really, what are we? We want to celebrate lake culture. That is at the forefront of one of the principles that we're trying to achieve. Uh, David, the next one, go through these quickly. Sustainable, we absolutely are embracing sustainable, both in architectural design, site design, and our approach to the development of the property. Uh, the next, David. Walkable is a huge uh, principle that we want to achieve. A trail system, connectivity, not just to our lands, but to the adjacent properties. Um, and, and making sure that this is a place that really respects and it integrates into nature. The next slide, please, David. Um, health and wellness is gonna be a key component of what we're doing, whether it be tennis facilities, a wellness center, and all other recreational components. David, next. Uh, as we've said before, the vision here is a lake cottage resort, a wellness retreat. David, next. Uh, and we've, we've talked about the demographics, making this welcoming to a wide array of people and seasonality. Um, and, and different user groups. Uh, David, next. Obviously trying to design something that it really can stretch into the shoulder seasons and making sure that it works for the, uh, the environment that we're in and, and a 12 season month, uh, a 12 month calendar, David. And really this is the existing property now and we can just go quickly through the last slide showing the vision plan. Yeah, the next one please. Obviously, um, Accessibility, getting better accessibility to the property from Peninsula Road. Next site, next slide, excuse me. Uh, this plan, which has been seen uh, for well over a year, year and a half now, really creating that green spine, uh, robust open space between the cabins, a significant tennis facility, a wellness center, and obviously dealing in an appropriate manner with docking. And we've agreed to cap the, the, the docking on the property. David Marks. And obviously looking at some opportunities where there might be some other components such as tent sites and eco cabins and some of the, uh, the other regions of the property. But again, always done in a very balanced uh, manner. Next slide, David. And again, as I said, a, a big issue, a big component that we we'll want to do is a trail system and open space and connectivity and really making this a, a destination for people on the lake as well as visitors to Muskoka. And that is a key component here too. We know that there's a lot of people that will gravitate to this who are existing uh, boaters and residents on uh, on the lake. And lastly, architecture is going to be a big, David, next slide, please. Architecture will be a big component of this. We want it to be interesting. We want it to be beautiful. We want it to be sustainable and really work with yourselves, work with great architects to ensure that everything is in a balanced approach and how it's situated on the site. So with that, I will end my presentation. There's obviously a lot of details in the policies which Mr. McDonald just went through. We are happy to answer any questions. We are happy to work through the process, but we urge you to just have a consideration for the concessions that have been made. I think if you go to any landowner, private or business, and, and ask someone to willingly uh, remove over 50% of their legal entitlements on a property, uh, I don't think you'd find many people that are willing to do that, and we have been, and we uh, remain committed to the property and to working with the broader community. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bustard. Uh, uh, committee, are there any questions at this point? Okay, seeing none, I assume that you will uh, stay on with us to answer any questions? Yes, absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on now to our our next, and I believe it is, yeah, so would it be Deborah first? Sandy. Sandy, Sandy McNair. Okay. I can see you. Mr. McNair, are you there?
So this is a presentation by the Friends of Muskoka, and I believe there are going to be five or six speakers. So we are just now letting them in. And I believe, Mr. McNair, you're, looks like yes, your microphone's I'm... on. There you are. Do, do you have video? Uh, start video, here we go. There's many different buttons to hit. There we there go. There you are. Okay, and I believe, uh, Somebody is running your presentation. Yes, I will, sorry. One of the things we need from everybody is uh, full state your full name and, and address before speaking. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, and then I believe we're going to bring up your presentation. Mr. McNair? Yes. Uh, are you there, Mr. McNair? Yeah. Hello, so we're, we're ready. So can I have your, your full address and? My name is Sandy McNair, uh, 1329-1 Breezy Point Road on Lake Muskoka. Um, and if you can bring up my first slide, that would be great. Hello. Yep, yep. Everything takes longer in the IT world, I'm discovering. So, okay. There you go. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. We're having difficulty with your audio. I'm not sure what's happening here. Although I have to end something here. I think I have two sessions going and I need to get rid of one. Okay. I'm just going to drive it. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My colleagues and I will share with you results of new research on Muskoka residents' thoughts, priorities, and concerns about the redevelopment. Oh boy, I'm getting killed. Hang on a sec, please. If, if uh, staff can throw me off of the public one. You mean your YouTube one? Have you got YouTube going, Mr. McNair? I think I do. I've got to get rid of that. You have to get rid of that, yes. Um, how do I do this? Let's get out of here. Minimize. Oh, uh, boy. You, you have to actually exit it. And we can't do that for you. Here we go. I think I got out of YouTube. There we go. We got okay. YouTube. Take so it away. All trouble. Wow, this is much trickier than I had expected. Yes, I think I'm off the YouTube. Are you? Can you see me? Uh, no. Try again. Okay, I'm going to start now. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. My colleagues and I will show you the results of new research on the residents' thoughts and concerns about the redevelopment of the app. Slide two, please. We, you are cutting out uh, a lot, Mr. McNair. Is, is there the possibility that somebody else could maybe do this part then? No. The research was conducted by IMI, the respected firm, Do you have earphones you could plug in? Might be helpful. Oh, I don't know. Would it be an internet connection? 
Here, how are we doing now? Well, are we good? Hello. Uh, Hello. So far, okay, let's try now. Great, so um, if we could go back to slide one. Sorry, I must have been much trickier than I expected. Thank you, slide one, perfect. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My colleague, today, my colleagues and I will share with you the results of new research on Muskoka residents' thoughts, priorities, and concerns about the redevelopment of Cleveland's house. Next slide. The research was designed and conducted by IMI International Research, a respected firm with a roster of blue chip clients in a 50 year history. The research was launched May 3rd with findings from May 12th. Next slide. We provided summaries of this material to council and to David Pink on May 20th and to the 800 survey respondents who requested them on May 27th. Today, we will amplify the major themes from that research. Before turning to the results and their implications, I will address two technical points arising from the res this research. First, the sample size, more than 1,530 responses means that the results are credible and reliable. And that sample size has since grown to more than 1,700 respondents. In IMI's view, this is an unusually strong response and it provides an accurate reading of residents' views with a low error rate of just two and a half percent plus or minus. That's very small. Second, the core questions about the future of Manette returned overwhelming results. There are no close calls, no 5149s. The results on the core questions are typically 8515, sometimes as high as 955. We have clear agreement on what matters most to our respondents. Here's what those technical points mean for our presentation today. It means engagement. This research is broadly based. Our 1,530 plus respondents represent more than 4,500 res residents across Muskoka. Not just from the big three lakes and TML, but Lake of Bays, Seguin, Georgian Bay, the three towns, and many more lakes and rivers. The level of consensus across 1,530 voices makes this research notable. Manette's profile and impact travels far and wide. Our respondents also maintain their personal connections in Muskoka through memberships in one or more community groups, including Friends of Muskoka, the Muskoka Lakes Association, Safe Quiet Lakes, the Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center, Muskoka Conservancy, Muskoka Ratepayers Association, Friends of Muskoka Watershed, and 44 more Lake Island Road and other associations. Manette is the subject of a lot of conversations on the dock, and our respondents are deeply concerned about what is going to happen there. Here's more evidence of strong engagement. More than 98% of the respondents volunteered more than 4,400 comments. The last question, do you have any final comments to share, itself generated more than 700 comments, all shared with Council and David Pink. It also means this research has application beyond Manette itself. More than, an, more than another 100 commercially zoned sites in Muskoka with 27 kilometers of shoreline now face pressures of looming waterfront residential condo and resort development. There's a strong incentive to get Manette right and to use its lessons to guide responsible development throughout the region. Third, and on the subject of Manette, Muskoka's many voices express a single message. And it's this, next slide please. The environment comes first. The strategic plan for the township of Muskoka Lakes also affirms this priority for the environment. Muskoka's unique natural environment, the rocky shores, the towering mature trees and the clear water is the source of almost everything good that occurs in Muskoka. It's why people choose to come here to visit and to live. 
We know from experience that if we get this wrong, next slide. We know from experience if we get this wrong and the result isn't sustainable, there's no easy undo button. If you could back up, please. Whatever is built in Minette must be built responsibly and must minimize changes to Muskoka's natural environment and character. Thank you for, for, my, for your time. Sorry for the technical issues at the beginning. My colleagues will continue our story. And this would be Deb Martin. Okay. Good morning, uh, Deb, how are you? Good morning, Chair Bridgman, I'm great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Deborah Martin Downs. Uh, I'm at, my address is 1367 Breezy Point Road, Township of Muskoka Lakes. Uh, I am president of the Muskoka Lakes Association and was a member of the Manette Joint Policies um, Joint Policy Review Steering Committee. You're right, uh, NECUS is a terrible acronym to have. <laughs> um, I'm also an environmental professional in my in my day job. So uh, I'm going to dig into uh, some of the concerns and I think um, we are using the same presentation. So if David, you could bring that back up before I get going in. I'm gonna dig into uh, the concerns about density and future growth. So you're going to slide uh, where, where Sandy left off. So slide nine, please. Yeah, no, great. Uh, I'm gonna dig into the concerns about density and future growth in Manette, which are related to questions 13, 15, 23, 28, and 30 of the survey we undertook. Uh, for our respondents, density is most easily recognized as a unit, a cabin, a cottage, a condo, a hotel room. So we asked based on the number of uh, 850 square foot unit, uh, 850 square foot uh, items, how many units did they think are appropriate on the Cleveland House property in Marina back to Peninsula Road? Um, as council is aware, you've heard today about the, the different densities that are permitted uh, through the different plans. So the old Policies permitted up to 4,000 units. Uh, the draft policies permit uh, to up to 2,000 units. And the Minet Committee, of course, recommended a maximum of 1,000 units. Uh, so the next slide, please. Uh, the results are clear. Uh, just 1.2% of the respondents thought 4,000 4, units was appropriate in this area. 6.6% thought 2,000 units was appropriate. And almost 84% thought 1,000 units would be the maximum appropriate density. The next slide, please. We also surveyed respondents on possible development form at Manette, and the respondents much preferred the 500 unit concept on the left to the wall of condos on the right. Why? Low heights, lots of green space. This plan, however, only shows one quarter of the development contemplated in the draft OPA. 500 units and 425,000 square feet versus 2,000 units and 1.7 million square feet. So that tells you something important that people felt that this is a, is a good plan, but it's, and it's at the right density. The OPA policies need to ensure responsible development to preserve the mature trees, to maintain safe boating, build sustainable density and keep building heights below the tree line. The next slide, please. Many uh, good environmental policies were adopted from the Minette Steering Committee recommendations. Um, some can be strengthened, including what will happen along the shoreline. Our respondents were concerned about building setbacks, proximity to the water, vegetated buffers, the width of the natural trees and plants that must remain along the shoreline, including beaches and lawns. The current township policy mandates 20 meter setbacks and 15 meter vegetated buffers, while the draft OPA policies make setbacks and buffers optional. The Manette Steering Committee recommended a mandatory 30 meter setback and 30 meter buffer to improve stormwater management and mitigate visual impacts from the water. Even where there are none today, we can build back better and we should. Our respondents agreed with 84% wanting 30 meter mandatory uh, buffers and setbacks, essentially to protect the water and to protect the view. And as we see with legacy in this picture, construction this scale has resulted in clear cutting and grading and everything runs toward the lake. Why would we build like the GTA on the shorelines of our lakes? Next slide, please. The draft policies also contemplate future expansion of development in this area beyond the 2000 units. 
Uh, the Manette Steering Committee recommended tough standards for future growth in Manette based on environmental and safety standards, as well as maintaining the area's low density and natural character. The character of our lakes, our shorelines, even our narrow winding roads, that's what draws people to Muskoka. So our goal is to protect that character. That's what brings value to tourists, to the cottagers that are surrounding this area, and to TML. So we asked respondents what kind of restrictions were important to them in considering growth at Manat, restrictions based on environmental thresholds, boating safety, road capacity, and safety, each drew 84 to 89% support. So that's clear enough. Further, 81% of the respondents believe that the township policy, and as recommended by this Manette Steering Committee, should permit no growth beyond the number of units in the draft policies, none. Next slide, please. So I'll conclude it on uh, question 30, where we asked Muskokans to rank their concerns on 21 potential issues. In all, we received more than 1,500 responses, and this is astonishing, uh, is that 86% of those respondents identified the same six fundamental concerns as important. The environment, building density, building height, voter safety, building setback, and tree removal. So Muskoka residents' central concern is that the redevelopment of Cleveland's house be done right. A light footprint that puts environment first has minimal visual and safety impacts for the neighbors. It's that simple. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak for you today and uh, allowing us to convey these results in a coordinated fashion. And I'll pass the torch to my colleague, Susan Eplett. Welcome, Ms. Eplett. Good morning. Thank Good you. Morning. Please, please carry on. I know you need, uh, you know, to give your address. I do, yes. My name is Susan Eplett and my address is 50 Wayborn Crescent. Toronto Postal Code M4N 2R5. Uh, <clears throat> new introduction for me, my mother-in-law was a remarkable woman who loved Muskoka for 70 years. She passed away yesterday at the age of 102. And when we talked about the challenges Muskoka is facing over the years, she always said the same thing, what can I do? So today I'm speaking in her honor. Following the discussion on development density and major impact concerns by Deb Martin Downs, I will address questions asking Muskokans about how the resort will be used, questions 9, 10, 22, 26, and 30 on the survey. Our first finding dispels that old myth that people in Muskoka are unfailingly opposed to any change. In fact, there is solid community support for the amenities of a new Manette resort. Restaurants and walking trails generated interest, with 57% and 39% of respondents indicating their intention to use these amenities. Offering a selection of retail stores was met, met with mixed interest, as was the golf course, marina, spa, and wellness center. Residents were not interested in hotel rooms and rental cabins. Next slide, please. Our research also looked at an issue that the township has been grappling with, which is how long unit owners may occupy their units. This is a central issue that helps distinguish resorts from residential properties. There's solid community interest in ensuring resort units remain available for rent by the vacationing public. The draft policies allow owner use for a maximum of 26 weeks per year, including four weeks maximum in July and August. The Manette Steering Committee agrees with the 26 week maximum per year, but extends the owner use period for the four week summer maximum to June 15 to September 15 to make more rooms available for tourism in the peak summer vacation period. So based on a 26 week per year owner usage maximum, about 23% of our respondents support a four week maximum in July and August, but about 40% support the four weeks from June 15 through September 15, and 21% are comfortable with either four week solution. Our respondents were very concerned about development remaining a commercial resort. My colleague, Ken Pierce, 
We'll discuss some terms we hope you will add into the draft policies to help prevent the resorts units from becoming residential cottages. Of course, strong enforcement will be crucial to keeping the resort units commercial. Next slide, please, David. Building height is an objective measurement. The township's current limit is 45 feet or four stories, with the stipulation that building heights not exceed the mature tree line. The draft plan, however, would permit buildings up to 11 stories in the residential area behind Judd Haven Road, which is about 400 feet from the shoreline. We therefore asked our respondents their opinion of the maximum building height in Manette, and they responded emphatically. 90% responded that building height should be limited to lower than the mature tree line behind Judd Haven Road, and even lower, four stories near the shoreline. About 5% thought a six story maximum was appropriate. And by contrast, 0.3% of respondents, or just four of 1,530 people, believe that as much as 11 stories, or about 100 feet, is appropriate for Manette. Finally, I will turn to how much residential development is appropriate. 85% of respondents are concerned about the amount of residential being planned at Manette. Many said Muskoka's, Muskoka's shores already feel overbuilt and that the overall Muskoka experience is deteriorating. Thousands of comments added on top of answers to specific questions are heartfelt and range from fear to hope, from anger to optimism. Through their own words, our respondents show that they aren't anti-development, they are pro-Muskoka, and they want to share their appreciation of Muskoka with all those who value the beauty of its environment. Thank you for your time, and I will return this over to Jordan Richards. Um, is... Yeah, could uh, we we we're having trouble finding Mr. Richards? Could you raise your hand, your electronic hand, so we can let you in? Sorry. Um. There's a witch, Richards. No, that's not him. So, okay. Um, do we have uh, somebody's on the telephone with a with a seven zero five number and a three seven three at the end? Would that be Jordan? Um. Okay, so I don't think we can locate him. So I'm going to ask uh, maybe Miss Epplett, where do we go from here in terms of what you'd like to do? I'm back. <laughs> I could. Um, we, we can't find uh, Jordan. We can't find Jordan. Um, Wait, just, no. Okay, so uh, I apologize for that. And Jordan brought a very unique voice. Um, so I will do my best to present his comments. Okay, that would be great. Thank you very much. I hope that's gonna be okay with all my colleagues who in the background. So uh, these comments are being presented on behalf of Jordan Richards, who lives at 2060 Peninsula Road in Manette, um, POB 1GO. That address is where Jordan has spent every summer of his life. It's right on Rosso between Cleveland's house and Legacy Cottages, which he first knew as Lakeside Cottages. So he's long had a ringside seat on Lake Rosso and how life there with the resorts has changed. The changes being discussed for the Cleveland's house property and the marina will have community impacts that extend beyond the property line and into people's lives in a way that may not always be obvious. Jordan was going to speak about those issues and our respondents' opinions on water safety, Peninsula Road, and staff housing. 
Boat safety is already a serious concern for respondents, as the 2019 Riverstone Environmental Boating Impact Study found that boating regularly exceeded safe capacity limits on busy summer days. Jordan and his family are avid swimmers and regularly face dangerous boaters traveling too close to shore due to congestion on Wallace Bay. The redevelopment of Cleveland's house and the marina is likely to make that situ situation even worse and for all users. A new nine kilometer per hour speed limit is coming and that should help, but respondents emphatically want limits on increased boating activity. There are 120 commercial boat slips in Minette and the township's draft policies would allow another 95, an 80% increase for the expected day visitors to the new restaurants, retail, wellness and sport facilities. In contrast, and based on the Riverstone study, the Manette Steering Committee recommended a maximum 24 more slips, an increase of 20%. And our survey respondents agree with 87% supporting no increase or 24 more slips maximum. Concern also carries over into boat access and boat launching at the resort. With up to 2000 units, 70% of which may be residential, 94% of respondents say it is critical or very important to get it right for boater and swimming safety. We respectfully suggest that the official plan provide a hard cap on the number of new boat slips permitted in the area based on the 2019 Riverstone study and our respondents' views and that council consider a mechanism to limit boat launches during busy periods. Next slide, please. Any major development in Manette will bring with it a constellation of resident concerns focused on Peninsula Road, including increased traffic, widening or other structural changes, widening the bridge at Port Sandfield, and the personal safety of cyclists and pedestrians. These concerns are priorities for our respondents in addition to their apprehension about the six core issues surrounding the environment, density, building heights, setbacks, boating safety, and the others. As Jordan has been a lifelong resident and user of Peninsula Road, he could tell you just how strategically important that road is. For example, under the best conditions, it takes 35 minutes to go from Manette to the Bracebridge Hospital. In a construction delay or a bridge closing, and that could be serious, especially if you're in an ambulance or waiting for emergency services to come to you. These issues are very real for those who live on Peninsula Road and those who use it and depend upon it. We respectfully ask that these concerns are heard and addressed in the new policies for Manette. Next slide, please. Lastly, staff housing. It's now industry standard practice in Muskoka, across Ontario and beyond, that large resorts provide staff housing on their own property. Jordan lived in staff housing when he worked in Banff Hospitality more than 30 years ago. He saw that planners appreciated the burden that accommodation had on surrounding communities and the environment. He believes that Muskoka deserves the same consideration today, as do I. The Manette Steering Committee recommended that staff housing for the Manette Resort be located on site, so the resort managers may better recruit, retain, and monitor their staff. We asked respondents, where in your opinion should staff housing be located? With characteristic clarity, 78 support a requirement for on-site staff housing, while 8% support no requirement. To understand just how widespread this sentiment is, we noted that support for on-staff site staff housing was supported by 84% of full-time residents, even higher than seasonal residents. Affordable housing is already in short supply in Muskoka and forcing staff into the general market will make that worse and increase traffic. Here again, the right thing to do is clear. Thank you. And I will now turn it over to our colleague, Lori Thompson. Oh, there you are. Ms. Thompson, Morning. welcome. Thank you. Take it um, away. Thank you. My name is Laurie Thompson. My address is One Stepping Stone Island, Lake Rosso. I'm president of Friends of Muskoka and was also a member of the Manette Steering Committee. I won't try to say the whole thing. 
Friends of Muskoka and the Muskoka Lakes Association appreciate the thousands of hours invested by stakeholders and the progress on many points in this official plan, including stronger environmental policies and density reductions. I'd like to acknowledge Mitchell Goldhar, who purchased the Cleveland's House property complete with ICBL in 2019. I'm looking forward to recognizing Mr. Goldhar for deploying his skills and resources in the net to achieve a widely appreciated project with a light footprint and the smallest environmental, visual, and safety impacts. This will enable an entirely new generation to come to Muskoka and enjoy, as we do, its unspoiled natural beauty. Today, however, we have an obligation to the future Muskoka to get the details right and to get strong, clear language into this official plan. Language on implementation, monitoring, and enforcement that's not susceptible to interpretation or challenges. We surveyed our community's opinions on key policy areas. To, pro to provide grounding for those opinions, we first educated respondents on OPA policies because they're necessarily long, technical, and not easily understood. As we discovered, the community is very interested. As you've just heard, the Muskoka community is supportive of redevelopment of the Cleveland's House lands, but only if done responsibly. Um, do we, David, do you have the, the next slide there? The next one after that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, and for our community, responsibly means environment first, protect our lakes. Don't build densely. Please no blocks of townhouses on the waterfront. Retain mature trees, of course not all of them, but enough to provide shade and cooling in the hot summer and to diminish the visual impact of the development. Tree retention is a stated goal in the official plan amendment, but does not make its way into the general development policies and we believe it should. Set back the development well back from the lake and make this mandatory, except ward and grandfathered. Buffer with lots of vegetation, keep building heights well below the tree line and please no residential subdivisions. Building responsibly also means keeping safety front of mind. Please don't overcrowd small Wallace Bay with boats and slips. Study and address the impacts and now what changes need, will need to be made and who's going to pay for them. Our community is asking you, councillors, to make sure that what is built is the least intrusive and the most protective of the environment. Preserve what we call the view from the canoe. We've worked with professionals to draft language for the official plan amendment. There are no surprises or major changes. Our recommendations are outlined in the table and marked up OPA that we sent to council on Wednesday. And Ken Pierce will describe these in more detail. The policies from the net need to be strong and clear so they won't fail if challenged and can resist conflicting interpretation. I've spoken with, when I've spoken with Ms. Bustard and Mr. Goldhar, I've been reassured that what they intend to build really is something that is low impact and will fit with our community's vision of Muskoka. But a main theme running through the comments in our survey is one of fear, fear of what might be built. While Mr. Goldhar's concept plan is for 500 units, the draft OPA allows four times that and calls this a build out plan, which is a frightening expression, as if the goal is to build 2000 units. I don't believe that's anyone's goal, not councils, not Mr. Goldhar's, and certainly not the communities. And yet there is potential to build even more. Uh, next slide, please, David. Thank you. This OPA provides growth limits only for Mr. Goldhar's lands, 287 out of the 522 acres in the village. The, uh, the blue and uh, yellow areas, dark yellow areas shown on the map. And what about the rest of the lands? As Mr. McDonald said during his presentation, this draft plan allows for additional growth, both on Mr. Goldhar's lands and elsewhere in the net based on district growth plan and the support of a market study. So based on economic factors. The Minette Steering Committee recommended, and our survey confirmed, environmental character and safety factors must also be growth limiters, and we need a hard cap on ultimate growth. The Altus Waterfront Economy Study, commissioned by you, by Council, confirmed that we certainly don't need this growth to satisfy the tourism market. Please give the community certainty on potential development in Minette. Make it very difficult to build more or for the village boundaries to be expanded. Minette is not a good place to build a large residential node, let alone a large resort village. Three years ago, shoreline development was a big election issue. And as our survey confirms, it's an issue that the majority of your constituents care deeply about. Please make the policies for Minette as strong and as tight as you can. 
please consider the impact of your decision on our community, both now and for future generations. Friends of Muskoka and the MLA are more than willing to work with you to help make this happen. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pierce, next, is that what I'm gathering? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pierce, welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, hey. I take it that everyone can hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Very good. Uh, Ken Pierce, 2232 Muskoka Road, 169 Gravenhurst. Uh, I'm a director and secretary of Friends of Muskoka and will be speaking on behalf of Friends and the Muskoka Lakes Association. Uh, as Laurie Thompson mentioned, uh, we provided a chart uh, setting out our high level comments, uh, which sets out the old Manette OPA language, uh, Manette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee recommendations, uh, draft Manette OPA language, and our suggestions and, and commentary. Uh, we've also provided a revised, sorry, revised draft of the Manette OPA. Uh, we've color coded it for ease of reference, uh, showing the old current Manette OP language in red. And that's quite frankly, a majority of our suggestions, uh, further supplemented by suggested language in pink, uh, including some of the uh, steering committee recommendations and finally comments in green. Uh, the old Manette OP from 2007 contains a number of useful provisions uh, that have not been brought forward uh, in the current draft. Uh, for example, and, and these are a couple of the key ones, uh, we've moved from municipal services to private communal services and back now to municipal services. However, there's a couple of provisions that have not been uh, brought forward. Uh, the mandatory requirement to connect to municipal services in the current draft has been changed to encourage to be connected. Uh, and similarly, the setback requirement when loco locating a municipal sewage treatment plan has been dropped. Uh, another example is character. Uh, the draft language has been carved back substantially uh, such that character in Manette is now essentially rocks and trees. Uh, gone is the reference to the iconic hotels and, and all of the other references to character uh, did not find their way in. Uh, especially in light of the recent Bala Bay Inn decision, uh, it may be worthwhile to consider adding back uh, the current language. These are but two examples. Uh, we respectfully request Council consider uh, several other instances we have noted uh, where it may make sense to retain the uh, currently in place language. Uh, density, as we've heard, is an extremely important issue. Uh, the old Manette OP provided up to approximately 4,000 units on the Cleveland's house lands, and the major developer is now proposing up to 2,000 units. Uh, while we and our supporters would prefer to see something less than this, uh, Council will have to grapple with this particular issue. Uh, that said, once Council has come to a landing on density, we hope that that will be the end of the matter. Uh, in section C1.2 under development plan, the density permissions are described as fundamental elements uh, and principles. However, there are a number of instances where uh, this could uh, be uh, uh, actually not be the case. Uh, and one uh, important example is section C1.3.2.9, which to paraphrase states that an objective is to establish an appropriate level of density. With respect, uh, we suggest that this is exactly what Council is doing now, uh, making such a provision unnecessary. We don't feel that the, the, the additional flexibility for additional density down the road is really something that, that you would want to uh, allow in. Uh, we invite Council to carefully consider the use of permissive and or vague language, uh, words such as discourage, encourage, where appropriate, major, and so on versus mandatory language such as shall and will. Uh, in my opinion, permissive language may render a provision unenforceable. Uh, LPAT has made it abundantly clear that encouraging someone to do something or discouraging them from doing so carries little or no weight. Some examples are as follows. Uh, in the uh, section about staff accommodation, C1.4.8.1 provides that efforts shall be made to locate staff accommodation in Minette. Um, uh, basically saying uh, you're asking someone to try. Uh, in section C1.4.2.I, 
uh, provides that development and redevelopment shall incorporate where appropriate 15 meter waterfront vegetative buffers and 20 meters building setbacks. Uh, Deb Martin Downs described this as optional setbacks. Unfortunately, I agree. Uh, section C 1.5.1.2B requires that major development uh, proposals uh, maintain appropriate shoreline buffers. Unfortunately, I'm not sure who decides what is appropriate. Uh, and I would not really be enthusiastic about leaving this uh, up to LPAT to determine. Section C 1.4.2.3 and C 1.5.1.2 refer to uh, restrictions uh, regarding major development. Uh, the question to me is, what is major? Uh, we hope that many of our suggested changes will be viewed as non-controversial and, as I said, to a large extent, they simply bring forward for consideration language from the currently in effect Manette OP. Uh, we would also be pleased to consider our suggest or discuss our suggestions in more detail with Mr. Pink and or Mr. McDonald uh, at their convenience. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. Uh, please to answer any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pierce. Okay, so committee, do we have any questions? I don't see any questions, and um, and um, Ms. Thompson, I see your hand up, but we don't usually take more comments after this unless there's something directed to you. So as I see nobody in terms of panelists uh, with hands up, I'm going to thank you very, very much for your presentation this morning, and we will now continue on. Uh, we're actually going to take a um, let's say eight minute comfort break right now for everybody. It is uh, almost, well, that means five to 11. We will be back and we will continue on with hearing from our public. Thank you very much.
Okay, are we are we good to go? We're recording again. We're good. Okay. Uh, welcome back, everybody. We're going to continue on now, and I believe we. Oh no, we're not because we don't have quorum just yet. Let's wait. Let me get our other counselors to sign back in here. There we go. Okay. Um, and I see we have Planscape. I'm not, I'm guessing it's Stefan, but I'm, there you are. <laughs> okay. So um, welcome and please take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Mayor, Councillors and staff, and of course, uh, the, the public. My name is Stefan Sherback from Planscape Inc, 104 Kimberly Avenue in Bracebridge. Um, as many of you are aware, we are the planning firm representing the owners of the JW Marriott and the legacy resort properties within the community of Minette. And um, first and foremost, I just wanted to, um, uh, on behalf of the clients, we, we really appreciate um, the township's recent efforts to um, include a lot of the property owners within the Minette uh, working group meetings. Um, we fully understand and acknowledge that the focus of discussion is has really been on the you know the future development of the Cleveland's House properties. But again, um, it's important to understand the perspectives and uh, look at the entire community as a whole. Um, with respect to to our clients' interests, um, they've been clear in, in these discussions that their interests are to protect their current and existing development rights and use provisions um, that were supported by and approved through lengthy OMB and LPAT hearings. Um, we would like to uh, respectfully request three possible changes or wordsmithing options related to the policy set in front of you today. Um, first of all, um, we're, we're looking at possibility of including two site specific policy areas for the JW and legacy just to ensure that there's there's a, a separation and uh, just to ensure that there's no unintentional um, changes or alterations um, that may stem from future changes to these properties, uh, albeit if it's just a small site plan change or uh, you know some small alterations. We just want to ensure that uh, the proposed policy, uh, set, uh, including the appendices and the direction in front of you today, don't un uh, unintentionally change what uh, they have in place right now. Uh, we would be happy to assist Meridian and staff with uh, looking at these policies, looking at some possible wordsmithing or even providing some site-specific amendments in this regard. I do note uh, Mr. McDonald did uh, mention in one of his slides um, that some of these rules would not apply to the JW nor the um, the legacy, but again, um, perhaps it's just my my reading of the documents. Uh, but again, I'm happy to assist with some wordsmithing and uh, continue these discussions in that regard. Um, the second point is to support the long historical policy direction to eventually provide some form of municipal servicing within this community. Um, we understand that there's uh, been discussions related to a phased approach or a unit threshold. Um, again, something like that is, is, is also acceptable, uh, providing that the servicing continues to be contemplated, um, can, continues to be contemplated and the current service regime is also protected um, that's in play for the JW and uh, legacy today. And the third and last point, um, is with respect to the non-red leaves properties. Um, as planners, when conducting a review or a vision for an entire community, uh, it's common practice uh, to look at the community as a whole, not just specific properties. So long-term planning, uh, as many of you know, includes uh, a vision with goals and objectives, and the, the goals and objectives uh, are very appropriate in uh, what's in place today. But again, it's important to look at the entire community, not just those lands that are adjacent to or visible from the lake. Uh, when I look at the schedules, the non-red um, leaves lands account for possibly a third of the property that's out there. We understand that the focus is on a unit count specific to, to development of these resort properties, but we can't forget to uh, consider these lands and also um, to not limit any future development potential on these properties. As I've read the policies themselves, um, it seems like somebody may have to go through an official plan amendment for a simple severance on one of these properties. 
we have been in discussions um, and, and, and we do have uh, clients with respect to uh, certain points of these lands. But again, I think we need to uh, carefully consider uh, the policies in front of council as it relates to uh, these non red leaves lands and ensure, I mean, again, understanding that there's development rights associated with uh, certain resort properties, but again, to afford some flexibility to avoid a lengthy, expensive, long official plan amendment. If, if some simple property owner wants to sever a property or change a use uh, that's currently in place today. Again, happy to discuss uh, this with Meridium and, and looking at uh, crafting some policies to assist in that regard. Uh, just keeping it brief today. Again, thank you very much for the time um, offering, offered to us today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee, are there any questions? I don't believe I'm seeing any, so thank you, thank you very much, Stefan, and we will now carry on. So I'm going to um, suggest that if there's anybody in our attendees here who would like to speak or comment, um, would you just raise your electronic hand and we will get to you one at a time. So, all right, so Disha, can we bring in? Um, okay. Hello. Oh, there we are. Okay. <laughs> How are Dr. you, Mr. Beveridge? Very well. Dr. Massey Beveridge, 1180 Hemlock Point Road uh, on Lake Joseph. Thank you very much to all the people who have worked so hard uh, on all sides to, to find a workable solution to this. It seems likely that the outcome will be a compromise between the steering committee's proposal and the developer's pro proposal. Personally, I prefer a solution much closer to the steering committee's proposal with municipal services. It seems that seems a prudent addition. I'd much rather see something that was a real resort versus something that leans towards becoming a residences. But as council moves forward with this, my priorities would be to limit boat slips and boat traffic as well as peninsula road traffic. And perhaps if necessary, sacrifice uh, density of residential or uh, resort building back from the waterfront. I did that, you know, if they, if they build a long peninsula road there, that, that doesn't bother me very much. Um, I'm also very concerned about the precedence that we set with this um, development plan um, because there's so many other properties around the lake which could slide into this same situation. So that's certainly a component that I would like council to, to keep in mind. Finally, I was very interested by uh, the report that the steering committee received that suggested, and I, I can't pull it up on my screen right now, but I think that by 2046, 270 year round four season resort rooms would be needed to satisfy the visitors that would be coming to Muskoka. I recall there was a report on resort use done a few years ago for council that showed that even at the height of summer, the resorts we have were not completely full and that demand for resort rooms is down. Um, so the way this deal is structured for the buyer, it, it's neither fish nor fowl. Though the developer may be selling these properties to the consumer as your piece of Muskoka, it's really not your piece of Muskoka. You can only use it for six months of the year and only for a month or so in summer. But it's not really an investment property either. It's not something you're, you're buying simply to rent out. And we certainly, you know, everybody assumes that this project is going to be financially successful. I think we also need to consider the possibility it could turn into a giant white elephant 
and we don't really want to become the dodgy timeshare capital of Ontario. So um, those are, are my concerns. I thank the council and everyone involved for all their, uh, all their work and look forward to seeing how this evolves. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beveridge. All your, all your comments are noted. And uh, any questions from our committee? Uh, seeing none, I think we will we will just move on to our next speaker, and that would be. Sorry, Bob. Okay, Bob. <laughs> we don't have a last name just yet. Oh, Aub I think that's Aubrey. Okay, would that be Mr. Bailey? Yes, that is uh, that is Aubrey Bailey. Okay, uh, could could I ask you to turn your video on, please, right. Mr. Bailey? Okay, thank you. And just your address before you carry on with your comments, please. Yes, my name is Aubrey Bailey. I'm at uh, 14 M55 Kiwaden Island, Lake Muskoka, and uh, I did provide an open letter to members of council and to. I copied the planning department, so I presume uh, that is on the record and I do not intend to go through all of that letter and much of what is in that letter has been covered by uh, previous um, contributions from the MLA and Friends of Muskoka. But I would like to uh, reflect on the fact that the recommendations of the council's uh, special committee uh, have been substantially uh, not found their way into the official plan and I don't need to go through uh, all of the individual details but I think I was uh, quite uh, supportive of the special counsel's recommendations and would uh, and I think particularly in the area of density uh, would support that. More importantly I was concerned that the proposed OPA lacks what I call transparency. And it seems to me that the talk about uh, the area being rooted in the, the history of the resort operations, uh, and then one looks at the actual proposals, uh, what is driving uh, the projects here is really residential development. The uh, uh, the resort commercial development, the residential development, the really the economics is being driven by the development and sale of individual residential properties. And it seems to me that by uh, any reasonable observation, this represents residential development as opposed to uh, resort development. And when we look at the definitions of resort commercial, resort commercial accommodation units and, um, and the residential units, it seems to me that this is much more reflective of residential development on properties that are zoned resort commercial. And I don't know, I don't know the history to know how that uh, work, how that has evolved, but I would, uh, I would respectfully ask members of council to, uh, can, as they review the, uh, the draft uh, OPA, that uh, they really look at how to solve the problem of residential, uh, sorry, resort commercial properties being entitled to develop on a residential basis. And it seems to me that is the problem that we are going to face for uh, on all of the residential commercial, sorry, all the resort commercial properties. And if we uh, continue to permit uh, residential development in those properties without the controls that are in place for residential development on residential zone properties, we're gonna continue to have this sort of problem uh, for years to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee, any questions, comments? Seeing none, then thank you very much. Oh, I see Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, maybe just a point of uh, clarity that maybe uh, Director Pink um, 
uh, or uh, Mr. McDonald can clarify, because I've heard it a few times now where people are worried about um, what goes on in Manette can happen at a number of other properties and the other commercial properties and zoned. Um, and I, I just, I think it might be helpful to understand that Manette is unique, almost like a Port Carling or a Bala, and that I don't believe there's any other areas like this across Muskoka Lakes uh, that could happen to this particular level. So maybe uh, we could just clarify that because it might help people going forward. Okay, uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, uh, Chair Bridgman. Uh, that's correct, uh, Mayor Harding. I, I certainly look at Minette as a very unique uh, part of Muskoka Lakes. It is a settlement area. Uh, the idea is to provide full municipal services. There may be elements of the policies that we consider and are considered on other properties, um, but I don't think uh, from a whole scale perspective, uh, this can be replicated anywhere else. I do really think Manette is unique, um, but there are elements in it uh, that we can consider elsewhere, such as the enhanced character policies within the policy documents, some of the discussion on occupancy we may consider elsewhere but the sheer density and the scale of this proposal is very unique to Manette. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. Uh, any other thoughts, questions? Ready? Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Bailey. And we are now just going to move on to our next speaker who is coming in, uh, Lisa. Hello. Uh, Would you mind putting your video on? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Grogan Green, please go ahead. Just your address first. My name is Lisa Grogan Green. I reside at 133 Malden Hall Road, Toronto, M4N3H4. I've been a cottager on Little Lake Joseph with my extended family for the past 50 years, and I pass Manette daily as I travel, travel the uh, three miles to my cottage at Unit 1, 1119 Campbell's Road. I'm grateful to be able to speak today at this public meeting because it's exciting for me to see my friend Mitchell Goldhart's plan for Cleveland's house and Manette move forward. I have known the current owner of Cleveland's house, Mitchell Goldhart, for the past 35 years and up in Muskoka for more than 20 years. When the Friends of Muskoka first mobilized cottagers in early 2018 against what was then the Freed Plan, like many of you, I got very upset. Mitchell Goldhar, as a fellow cottager, was also deeply concerned. Some of us joined election campaign committees, others made sacrifices and ran for office. The existing council imposed the interim control bylaw and the Minette Steering Committee was formed. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Mitchell Goldhar did the only thing that he knew would stop Freed in his tracks. He bought the property. Looking backward at the turn of events, this $45 million maneuver revealed itself as the only solution to legally stop the Freed plan. To borrow Thom's slogan, Mitch Goldhar saved Muskoka and for this, I am extraordinarily grateful. As we know, the LPAT decisions related to legacy touchstone and villas did not go the friend's way. And even our own newly elected council heeded its advisors and lifted the interim control bylaw, thus allowing legacy to proceed. I've reread several times the final June 2020 recommendations of the Manette Steering Committee shared his background for the survey we were asked to complete. And I've compared them to the proposed OPA and see that almost all of the committee's recommendations, in fact, were accepted verbatim, particularly as they relate to protecting the site's ecological features, restoring the health of its wetlands, and protecting the water quality of Wallace Bay. Unfortunately, the MLA and FOM survey did not explain or bring to life in fullness or fairness for their memberships what is visible in the details of Mitchell Goldhart's plan and outlined carefully in the OPA. 
Mitch has given up more than 50% of his density, far more than any other developer would be willing to do. I wonder how many of certain interested groups would be offering to have their legal rights for their properties. Shoreline buffers, for instance, of 100 feet are being put forward that others would not implement at their own properties. And in fact, have been, it has been removed as a suggestion in the official plan draft review. The OPA before us sets out best practices for environmental sustainability and imposes restrictions that have not yet been imposed on any other Muskoka developer. It is in fact a standard setter for the first time, for instance, a single unit is given a maximum size of square feet. So anything larger reduces density commensurately. It's been difficult for me personally to see such a one-sided survey produced with leading questions designed to induce once again, both the fear of FOM and MLA members and to provoke comment. It was also difficult back in 2019 and 20 to watch the steering committee sharpen their pencils when I knew the reason for it to even exist was greatly diminished once Mitchell Goldhar bought the property. Nevertheless, I remain grateful for the knowledge this committee has gleaned as it has deeply informed the broader OP review and hopefully will continue to improve Muskoka's governance of its environment in the years to come. Mitchell Goldhar, like Manette is unique. He takes his considerable responsibility seriously, pays attention to detail, listens, proceeds cautiously, thinks deeply, and is careful in what he says and does. He works like a Trojan and moves forward only after considering outcomes and studying impact. He will move slowly with Cleves and do nothing to harm at Muskoka and its future, quite the opposite. Wherever he devotes his precious time, incredible talent and energy success follows. Whether he is building smart centers and smart REIT, developing the Vaughan Metro Center, or elevating his Maccabee Tel Aviv soccer team to the Europa and Champions League. If one wonders what Mitch will do to Cleves, just drive by his cottage and I dare you to find it among the pines and birch he preserved and the many trees he has planted. You will not find it in a dark sky at night. Mitch impeccably restored and enhanced his heritage style cottage and left its original boathouse and docks untouched. At his own cottage, he put the environment first and he will do so again as he incrementally and slowly develops the Cleves property. Cleves is about to come alive again. Pervious pathways and a network of trails will connect the various amenities, the restored wetlands and protected woods. Barren areas will be reforested, landmark features protected and shoreline buffers restored. I personally cannot wait for the resort to open and see the permanent local and temporary jobs Mitchell Goulhar will have created. It truly is time to get out of Mitch's way and let him proceed. It's time to move on with approvals of, master plan development, of the master plan development agreement, the phasing and other key servicing and architectural details and plans. Let's go, and thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, committee, any questions? Uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, I, I really just wanted to make sure I understood uh, one thing that uh, uh, Ms. Grogan Green said. If I understood you correctly, we're referring to current council taking advice and lifting the ICBL. Is that what I? think you said? I think that you didn't, ex I'm sorry, am I? Yeah, I think you didn't uh, extend it. Mm -hmm. That's what I understood. Uh, it, would it be possible to have uh, maybe Mr. Pink weigh in on, uh, on how and why the ICBL is no longer in place? Of course, there, it, it would be. And um, 
including the history. I I think we need clarification. We this council did not put it in, but please go ahead, Mr. Pink. Hello, committee. Um, through the chair, the interim control bylaw uh, did expire uh, last summer in its entirety. That's a result of the uh, legislation of the Planning Act, which has strict timelines on the length of time an interim control bylaw can be in place. I think in particular, if the comments and the question are more in relation to uh, why the legacy cottages uh, property perhaps was uh, lifted uh, halfway through and was not extended after 2019, uh, that may be a, a more a better forum for a discussion in camera. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, legal advice uh, gained during that uh, matter and uh, perhaps it's best left in that forum. Does that help you, Councillor Kelly? Okay, Any anyone else? Nope, okay, well, thank you, Ms. Grogan Green. Thank you. And we will carry on. So our next speaker is Mr., looks like it's Mr. Potto coming in. Hi, can you see me? Here you are. Okay. Can you Frank, hear me? If you just uh, give your address, name and address before you speak, please. Sure. Uh, um, can you hear me okay? I can't hear you. Oh, I know. I know why. It's me who's on, not on speaking. I'm sorry. My technical stuff. Um, Mr. Potto, go ahead. Can you, yeah, can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. My name is Frank Potto. I live on Wistow Island which is in Lake Rosso in the Minette area, uh, PO Box 37, Port Carling, Ontario. I want to thank uh, council staff and also Mr. McDonald. Uh, I think the presentation you just gave was really good. I want to thank you all for your hard work in this area, um, uh, Chair Bridgman. I also want to say that I really appreciate the continued efforts of Mr. Goldhar and Ms. Buster to work constructively towards a solution that could be supported by all. And most importantly, I want to make it clear that I support the vision plan that Ms. Buster just shared for Mr. Goldhar's land holdings in Minette. I think many in our community would use the public amenities and be delighted to see the Cleveland House lands restored to their former glory in such a manner. I also appreciate that Mr. Goldhar has voluntarily uh, significantly reduced the proposed density from the plan presented by the prior owner and agreed to other concessions concerning owner usage and a cap on unit size. Now, Ms. Buster did not present detailed numbers, uh, but her slides seem to show uh, a project with no more than roughly 500 relatively small commercial resort units, a sports center with extensive tennis facilities, an upgraded marina, restaurants and shops, and what seemed like a relatively modest amount of residential units on the far side of Judd Haven Road. Importantly, I also heard in her comments, Ms. Bustard say that they were willing to agree to a limitation on their docking capacity in Wellis Bay. And I think that's critically important and something that's not in the current draft of the OP and something that needs to be added. Riverstone's boat impact assessment, the 2019 study made it clear that a limit on docking in Minette, as I believe Ms. Buster just said they're willing to agree to, should be included and clearly articulated in the OP. A hard cap on docking is not in there currently. Now, to put it in context, the Minister of Natural Resources says that Lake Rosso has a total surface area of roughly 6,400 hectares. The portion encompassed by Wallace Bay in the boat traffic study is less than 60 hectares, which means less than 1% of the lake surface of Lake Rosso. There are currently roughly 2,200 homes and resort units on all of Lake Rosso. And as uh, was noted, this plan allows up to close to 2,000 units to be built just on Mr. Goldhar's land. So we're talking about almost as many units. Now, granted, there's a cap on unit size, so maybe it's uh, not a one for one, but it's a, but it's a very significant increase. Uh, almost as many units on an area that's less than 1% of the water surface. And that's why I think it's very important to have a limitation on the ultimate amount of docks that can be built in this area. Riverstone's boat traffic study said the following, quote, Resort, results of the period count survey show that Wallace Bay regularly exceeds the available boating capacity. Riverstone reported that 90% of the boats operating the net were power boats. They also showed in their report that those beat boats need seven hectares of open water to operate safely. If you've got 60 hectares of surface and you need seven hectares per boat, that means you can really only have eight boats operating safely at any one time in that bay. Um, this is obviously before any new development contemplated in this OP. Now, Mr. McDonald noted in his comments that Riverstone could not establish a causal relationship between the increased boat traffic and the increase in resort units over the past 12 years. 
just to be clear, uh, I was a member of the Minnesota Policy Review Steering Committee. I helped oversee the boats traffic study. That was not what Riverstone was asked to do. That wasn't part of their mandate. Uh, I will say, though, from my own opinion, if you do simple math, it's not hard to figure out that the increase in resort units did have a significant influence. Uh, boat traffic went up by roughly 50% from 12 years ago. Well, the number of resort units went up by about two thirds. Now, I'm pretty sure the number of cottages didn't go up by 50% in the last 12 years. And so I think there is clearly a relationship. And what's most important is that the area is already measured and demonstrated to be over capacity. Um, this OP, as I understand it, would take the hold pattern off of uh, some docks that are not yet built. Now, maybe I didn't understand that correctly. And so what Mr. McDonald said was the hold pattern won't be released until there's a change in the speed limit and there's further boat traffic studies, that's great. But there's no hard cap contemplated in this OP that says this is how many docks will ultimately be permitted in the area, which means that theoretically it could be hundreds more. And 200 boats is already 25 times more boats than can be safely operated in the area, according to Riverstone's boat traffic study. I, 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 as someone who lives on an island whose children have to go through this area to go gas up our boats and you know access the mainland, I just think that's an accident waiting to happen. I, I, I really support a lot of stuff that uh, Mr. Goldhar wants to do, but I think the most important thing that has to be changed in the OP is to put a limitation on the ultimate amount of boat uh, docking that's going to be permitted in the area. And, and frankly, I think it should also have a limitation on the amount of boats that will be launched on either a daily or a hourly basis uh, from Wallace Bay. If you have a limitation on boat docking, I think you also have to have a limitation on how many boats can be launched from dry docking, because if you've got a limited number of docks, but you launch, you know, 10 boats an hour, you're going to fill up the area pretty quickly. So, um, that was a key recommendation of the Minette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee. I think it could help the township avoid potential liability should a fatal accident occur. And I just think that, you know, a body of water is like a park. It has limited capacity. And just like at an amusement park, it's dangerous to exceed the capacity of the, of, of, of the amenity. Um, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is just that one point that was not, I think, necessarily clear in Mr. McDonald's presentation is that Resort usage would be permitted in the residential designated areas, which is the majority of where the majority of the units would be built. But there's no requirement to have any resort usage in those residential areas. And that means that up to 70% of the 2000 new units could be residential units. And I just, you know, I would not characterize 70% as being supplemental residential usage. Yes, in the waterfront area, it should be supplemental. But the question is, should there be any uh, resort usage required or should it be all 100% residential in the back areas? I'm not here to tell you what it should be. I'm just making that observation because I don't think it was clear in the presentation. I will point out that 850 square feet is much smaller than a normal cottage. And I appreciate very much Mr. Goldhart agreeing to that unit, that, that re reduction in limited size. I think it's a huge benefit. Uh, I'll also say though that 850 square feet is quite a bit bigger than a normal resort room. Uh, it's not as big as a cottage, but it is about the exact size of the average two bedroom condominium. And then lastly, I'd just like to point out what this means because he has given up a lot and I don't mean to say that he hasn't, but just to put it in perspective what 2000 units built out in Manette will look like compared to the average existing residential density in our township right now. Um, it's 120 hectares of land roughly. So 2000 units would be 17 units and 30 people per hectare, which fits with the tables you put up Chair Bridgman. To compare that 17 units per hectare, 30 people per hectare, and that's assuming you have two people per unit. Uh, it's 90 times the average summertime population density that exists in our township today. Our township in the summer, think how crowded it feels in the summer when all the cottagers show up and they swell the population to like 30,000 or more people. Those 30,000 people are spread out over 80,000 hectares of land in the township. It's roughly three hectares of land per person. We're talking about potentially going to something like 30 people per hectare. That's a 90 times increase. So I'm not here to throw cold water on the plan. I really appreciate and support the vision that was presented by Ms. Bustard. But as Lori Thompson noted, this plan contemplates putting in four times more units than I think was shown in that vision. And I'm deeply concerned about the impact that's gonna have on boat safety, which is why I think you need to impose a limitation on docking capacity and boat launch capacity on a daily basis in Minette Bay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McDonald, can I find you here? 
Could we just go back and review the, the docking again? Um, what is being proposed and the hold zone and all of that, just so everybody understands it, please? Yes, uh, yeah, uh, through you, uh, uh, Chair Bridgman, I acknowledge that in my presentation, I, missed, I misspoke in terms of what the overall intent is. Uh, what I can also say is that there is a lack of clarity about exactly what is approved and proposed right now, and there are differing opinions on that. Uh, so, for example, we've been using the word 215 or using the number 215, but just in talking to Mr. Pink about that issue, it may actually be a higher number. I'm also aware that a certain number of uh, docking units can't be established until the speed limit is lowered. I understand that as well and that the 20% uh, would be, uh, was the recommendation made by the steering committee over what was already in existence and not the ones that were potentially proposed subject to an increased speed limit. That might not clear anything up particularly, but what I can say is that when we come back to you with some type of reporting, we will have to be crystal clear on exactly what is, uh, what exists, what is approved, who thinks mm -hmm. what is approved and when, for that clarity, because I have to admit, I'm not 100% clear myself. Thank you, which is why this is a, a an initial draft, which is going to be exactly. uh, which is going to be updated, and that's why we're here today. So that's that's great. So okay, well, thank you, Mr. Pato. Um, we are going to move on now to our next speaker. Mm. We see, not quite sure yet who that is. Oh, Mr. Newell. Welcome, Mr. Newell. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ian Newell, uh, 1043 Sagamo Boulevard on Royal Muskoka Island, which is uh, John um, Judd Haven Road from Annette. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak today. Um, it's been my privilege also to have been involved in the Minette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee, which I'll call the Steering Committee henceforth, and also to have been involved in the subsequent uh, working group, working with the proponents and, and counselors and, uh, and, and planners. So uh, I am painfully aware of the long and uh, winding road it's taken us to get here, and I uh, uh, am well positioned to say thank you to everyone who has uh, uh, participated so far. Um, I don't envy council their task, it's complicated. Um, so how did the steering committee come to be? Uh, well, knowing that the uh, OMB had gone way too far with Minette in 2007, both uh, district and township council commissioned the steering committee in 2018 to help right that wrong. Um, it's my understanding that, that uh, the proponent acquired uh, Minette, the current proponent acquired Minette property uh, during the uh, interim control bylaw and while the steering committee was already underway. So um, uh, Mr. Goldhar understood that uh, Minette's development rights were under review. Now to, uh, to his and their credit, uh, uh, the proponent has been very willing and flexible to, uh, uh, during this whole process and much headway has been made uh, uh, thanks to their involvement and their, and their flexibility. Um, the, that said, the, 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 the wonderful development proposal that, uh, that Ms. Bustard presented today uh, looks great and thank you for that as well. Um, that said, the current uh, OPA will allow for much, much more than that. And uh, this OPA will unfortunately out, likely outlive uh, everyone around this table. Uh, and uh, the permissions in it vastly exceed uh, what the proponent uh, would need to develop uh, his plans. So I, I, I think it's reasonable for, to expect council to push a little harder in that regard. And I think the steering committee's uh, recommendations uh, constitute council's most balanced and defensible line in the sand as it were. Um, so while the, uh, this OP is much better than the status quo, it falls short of the steering committee recommendations and uh, council shouldn't shy away from adhering as closely as possible to steering committee guidance especially on matters of density and uses in the waterfront area. And that I think was well, well uh, reflected by the, uh, the joint presentation today by Friends Muskoka and uh, Muskoka Lakes Association. Uh, a separate concern um, that hasn't gotten much uh, attention is the huge undefined area known as the non-red leaves lands. 
Um, under the, I'm curious as to uh, how this would work. Under, under this OPA, once it's passed, say, um, for the non-red leaves lands, if someone applied to rezone, let's say 120 acres, uh, to resort commercial or to take advantage of community residential zoning, I wonder what criteria would be used to determine whether the application would be successful and how much density would be permitted. Uh, should we be worrying about another thousand units? And I would put that to Mr. McDonald um, and to Mr. Pink. Uh, to close, a huge amount of effort has been done by a whole lot of people uh, and a lot of recognition and appreciation is, 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 uh, is appropriate here, including to the proponents. Um, for council though, this, uh, this OPA represents your one and only chance to get it right for Minette for generations to come. And I think the best way to accomplish that is to respect the process that was begun three years ago with the steering committee. Please stay the course as best you can. And uh, thank you for your service and for this opportunity to speak today. Mr. Newell, uh, Mr. McDonald, would you like to respond to Mr. Newell's comments? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I would. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Bridgman. With respect to the non-red leaves area, uh, certainly when I became involved, I also was concerned about there being uh, a real lack of direction on what could happen there. And as a consequence, I included a policy in the draft OPA that basically said nothing could happen until an application was made of some kind and a future assessment made. Uh, I admit that's probably not the most appropriate way to go. And my mind is certainly open to considering alternatives. Um, in terms of future planning, we are planning for Minette. Uh, there is a part of it that has no plan on it. That is troubling to me. So I agree that that is something that needs to be addressed. And there are ways that it could be addressed. I won't speculate on what they are at this point, uh, but your concerns are, are well-founded in my view, and we'll certainly take a look at them moving forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comments, uh, committee? I believe we're good. So thank you, Mr. Newell. And we will move on to our next speaker, who I believe is Mr. Richards. Who looks to me like he's still in his ski clothes. <laughs> oh, are you there, Paul? You unmute yourself. Suck. There we go. Oh. Okay, and video oh, great. Doing? You're you're good. You're you're good. So just your address, please, and carry on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Paul Richards, <clears throat> twenty six Dependence of the Road, <clears throat> Manette, POB one J zero one J zero my 82nd year in Muskoka. I thank the Township and Council for this opportunity to be with you today. I will be speaking about certain specific issues, but first I want to make three background observations. The original rezoning of Manette initiated by Fowler in 2007-2008 was a total disaster, approved by a development-friendly mayor and council against a unanimously opposed Greater Manette community, which being ungunned, we had no ability to stop it. This whole mess 15 years ago has created all of the problems we are facing today. The so-called concessions currently offered by the Goldtar team may have much to do with market demand and maybe even a lack of any demonstrated demand for a four season hotel rooms with community mindedness and goodwill. That then with community mindedness and goodwill. This development would be adding many more residential type homes, but no traditional 100% resort owned accommodation for the traveling public during the tourist season. And what happens we, we talk about the goodwill of, of the cold hard team. What happens if they lose interest in sell? We have to hope for the best and plan for the worst. The Goldhar's current proposal, which is supported by our mayor, 
our mayor, will include up to 2,000 units, nearly twice the size of what you see of Friday Harbor. Is the slide available, please? This is what a thousand units looks like. Take a good look. Four floors, Friday Harbor, thousand units. Talk to members of the Hamlet of Manette community who are to a person repelled and disgusted by the 43 house subdivision at Legacy. I hear widespread concern about many issues. The sheer size of the Gold Heart Project, its appearance from the water, density, water pollution, safety in the water, the roads, and the bridge at Port Sandfield, which would have to go, and the fact that this monstrous residential development might do nothing to serve the traveling public and judging at least from what happened to the merit will probably offer minimal employment to local people. Now, two of the specific issues I want to address, septic and trees. And septic is a terribly important for the community. We are happy to see the recommendation of the municipal septic servicing of the proposed development, as it will help prevent another merit septic spill debacle, which I was, I have directly witnessed or been part of major septic spills at all four commercial sites in Manette. I suggest that both the, the Merritt and Legacy Cottages should be required to connect to municipal services when available, as we know from experience that systems can and do go wrong. I'd much rather have our provincial government responsible for monitoring and compliance with ministry rules than having to rely on private interests. I understand that the developer, Mr. Goldhar, will be required to pay for the construction of the services, which is appropriate, but our community is very concerned about the financial impact to the taxpayer in the long run. Once the services are assumed by municipality, who will pay for ongoing operation, maintenance, and ultimate replacement? Has this analysis been done? Clear cutting. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? No, it's the, uh, it's the next one, sorry. That's the Friday Harbor, there we are. Uh, <laughs> I really, I really don't have to say very much. If you look at the left, this is the, the legacy project and it, it, it's, it's, it's so important for everyone, everyone in Muskoka to see what's happened here. Just look at this recent photograph. One or two small trees are left standing in the middle of this entire 17 acres site. Think about transplanting this approach to 65 waterfront acres at Cleveland's house, or the entire 287 acres, including the lands behind Judd Haven Roads. This doesn't have to be done. Those of you who have visited the Muskokan can see what can be done with good taste and high density. They've left the trees standing, but just look at that desecration of nature. The new draft OPA states to protect and enhance environmentally sensitive areas and ensure that where development is permitted, its design and construction shall be done in a manner that, live, that limits site disturbance and protects natural features and functions, protects the tree canopy and protects and enhances the natural features and their functions that contribute to the neat, unique character of Manette. However, this goal for Manette is not included in the new development policy. The new policy will require minimizing disruption to and on existing topography and vegetation as viewed from the water, but there is no specific requirement to maintain mature trees. Maintaining mature trees is essential for softening the visual impact of built form as seen from the water 
and for the role trees play in stormwater retention and shading. So the resort does not need to run its air conditioning 24 seven in the heat of the summer. Where will resort guests find shade if all the trees come down as they have at Legacy? Stay well, have a great summer, and make sure to have both your vaccinating shots. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Uh, any comments, questions? Uh, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair, I wonder if I could direct a comment uh, from a previous uh, mention uh, from, uh, to Nick McDonald. I wonder if I could get Nick on the on the screen. And thank you for that, through you, Chair. So, Nick, I, I, I obviously doing a lot of listening today. Um, there's a lot being said. I'm I'm hearing from you something that that is new to me. We've been uh, close throughout this process. I'm hearing you use the word concern, and if you're concerned, I'm very concerned, as may others be, that there are there are gaps in this this piece. We put this first uh, draft out. Here we are now with the public. Um, I thought this thing was pretty buttoned down, and and I thought it was you know you are our guide, I suppose, not our leader. But, you know, we take your advice, we shape our thoughts and uh, dreams based on a lot of what, your guidance. And um, to hear that word a number of times come out of your mouth over the last little while about um, uh, density, docks, um, non, uh, you know, non-Cleaves non property. I wonder if you could sort of uh, shed any light on that in terms of maybe just in, for the public, certainly from my own edification, um, I wasn't aware that there was, uh, you know, uh, chasms here, gaps perhaps, and certainly that's why we're here today. But I, I'm, I'm concerned that you're concerned. Thank you. Mr. McDonald. Um, uh, happy to respond. I think when I use the word concern, I think the focus of my comment was on the non-red leaves component of the project. And I indicated uh, very clearly that when I received the draft amendment that was received by this council and then handed over to me. It was not dealt with in that amendment. Um, and there was no ability to go back and initiate a whole bunch of discussions with folks to figure that out. So what I did was the next best thing, was, which was basically to lock down the non-red leaves area in policy and basically say nothing can happen until somebody makes an application and as uh, Stefan indicated earlier, uh, that would mean going through an official plan amendment process. So I essentially parked the whole thing because I was concerned about there not being any vision for those lands. That was the extent of it. With respect to the rest of the amendment, uh, while there is some clarity necessary to figure out exactly the, the current docking situation and what is approved and what is exists and what exists, the rest of the amendment is very well put together, in my opinion, uh, it, it, and, and in a manner that I think implements the vision expressed uh, by uh, Ms. Bustard and Smart Centers and Mr. Goldhart. What I can say, though, is that there is always room for improvement to ensure that the clarity I think the community and council needs uh, in this amendment is achieved. Um, and I can certainly see there being a number of enhancements made to the policy. But I think you've got a very good framework in this amendment to move forward. Uh, the devil is always in the details. There's a lot to think about through implementation. And I'm certainly uh, very open to getting to a point where that clarity is there uh, for all parties. Uh, so uh, just to be clear, my concerns were only with the non-red red leaves component and the lack of vision established through previous steering committee discussions and working group discussions. Okay, thank you. All right, any other comments? Okay, uh, then we will uh, carry on for our next speaker, who, who is going to be, all I see is Patty. So if you, if you can hear me, Patty, could you unmute yourself, please? Yes, and yes. Tur turn on your video. Video. 
There we go. All right. Okay. Okay. Could you give us your full name and address before you start, please? Yes, Patty Henderson. And I spend uh, four months of the summer at 14 King Street in uh, Rosso, Ontario, and the uh, remaining eight months in Toronto. And uh, similar to uh, Lisa Green Grogan's, uh, I have known Mitch for, for decades, um, personally. And I am, uh, first of all, this seems to me to be one of the most uh, collaborative and patient developmental processes that has been going on. And, and that is kudos to everybody involved at all levels. Um, it's not for me to speak on the minutia of the details. What I can speak to unequivocally is that Mitch bought the property with the intention of restoring the glory of Cleveland's house and that everything that he will uh, do there is with the thoughtful, mindful intention of having that property be for uh, be, be, be a positive experience for people who are unable to spend most of their time uh, in Muskoka and that he is and will be very, very uh, concerned, I know, about the safety issue that has been spoken of recently regarding the, the boating and of course the density uh, uh, conversations that have been going on. But in my estimation and knowing Mitch as I do, that uh, I believe that what he will build will, will not be the white elephant in the room. It will actually be a shining example of Muskoka development and it will set a precedent in that means to what can happen in future lands across the Muskokas. So uh, I just wish everybody well in their further discussions, but uh, I unequivocally trust Mitch to develop. I think it would be remiss of any developer to not request what he is requesting, even though what has been planned is far below what has been granted. And I think we have to have and honor some of that faith in Mitch and Paula and the vision for both Minette and Cleveland's house. So I wish everyone well with that. I look forward to seeing Cleveland's house being restored and thank you all for all your hard work. Thank you, Patty. Could we just, just for the record, could we get your last name again and would you mind spelling it? Oh, sure. Uh, Henderson, H-E-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E okay, thank you. Uh, anyone, uh, anybody, committee, any comments? I don't believe so. So thank you for that, uh, Ms. Henderson, and we will carry on with our next speaker. Who is Mr. Slightem? Slightem. Just coming in. There you are. Okay, great, Mr. Slightem. If you would just give us your address before you make your comments, please. Full name and address. Thank you. Chris Slightem, a uh, family cottage on Tobin Island. And uh, I don't know the exact address of it. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we'll take your, we'll, we'll take, if you live at a, some other address somewhere, we'll take that one. Sure, 186 Glen Karen Avenue, Toronto. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I just wanted, I didn't plan to speak today, so I don't have uh, prepared notes, but uh, listen, I was very curious to listen in and, and hear about all the uh, great work that the committee has done and uh, Friends of Muskoka and the MLA, uh, we're all very lucky to have so many people committed to uh, making sure that Muskoka, you know, continues on in the history that, that it has. Uh, I'm excited to you know, have my 50th summer in, uh, in Muskoka this year and uh, know Wallace Marina and, and remember it well and, and still go there today for our boat gas. Uh, and so I have a, a fond memories of, of the area in Cleveland's house and wouldn't want to see anything 
um, disrupt the, uh, the, the experience that all of us I know enjoy tremendously. Uh, so I had, to, I had to speak up because uh, uh, there's a lot of conversation around concern about growth and, and what's going to happen here. And, and I, all very, very valid concerns. Um, but I want to reiterate what uh, both Patty and uh, Henderson and Lisa Grogan Green mentioned about Mitch, because I, I too uh, can speak to his uh, interests in terms of knowing him uh, over the last uh, 15 years or more. And uh, when I had heard the rumor that he had uh, stepped in to acquire that site, I just sent him a little note saying thank you. Uh, because knowing who he is as a person, I was so excited and pleased to hear that he would uh, commit time, capital, energy to this project um, to ensure uh, that the experience that Muskoka is and that we all enjoy is maintained. Because as is clearly stated, you know, there could be 4,000 units on this property. Uh, there could be somebody come in here and clear cut the land, like unfortunately experience uh, that was just shared at Legacy. And that's where my concern is, and that's why I needed to speak up, is because my concern is, is if you, if we, you know, in, in, good, in good interest, um, take too heavy of a hand and create too many roadblocks for somebody like Mitch, uh, he may, you know, <laughs> there, there is a point at which, you know, he, he may have to just say, you know what, I tried to help, but I can't. Uh, because there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, our ability to, to, you know, do something here that's going to be great for the community. And that's a tremendous concern for me. I've seen in different places uh, where developers who had great visions, um, you know, get, you know, held back and, and eventually they give up and then something else appears. And so that's less favorable. And that's where my concern is today. And I hope that and I can tell that everybody here is, is so committed uh, and, and we are so lucky to have so many great people involved. But I think it is important to know that the person um, in charge so, or, or the person that, that, that is trying to shepherd this uh, is somebody that you want. And I think it was Lisa that maybe mentioned, you know, if you, if you tried to find his cottage, you, you couldn't because, you know, he, you know, he actually painted it green to have it blend into the environment. He, he's so thoughtful on everything that he does. And uh, I just wanted to, to you know, share that uh, because I, I would hate to see uh, uh, such, uh, hate to see the right person who has committed, who doesn't need to do this, who has enough on his plate on a daily basis, works harder than anybody that I've ever met, uh, but has his heart and his thoughts in the right place to make this the absolute best experience. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and thank you so much to everybody uh, for all that you've done to ensure that uh, this process goes, goes very well. Thank you, Mr. Slightum. Any, any comments, committee? I don't see any, so I think thank you and we will move on to our next speaker. which I think is Mr. Wilcox, or Silcox, sorry. They're unmuted. You are unmuted. Would you mind turning your video on? Uh, I'm afraid that uh, I have a very, um, let's say unstable uh, internet connection. It's been going out uh, about 10 or 15% of the time during this presentation. So I haven't heard everything uh, precisely. Uh, and I don't know how to turn my video on. Uh, this has been a, uh, let's say an eye opener for a Zoom call. I, I take a lot of Zoom calls and I'm on them, but I've never uh, uh, gone through the process uh, of, of dealing with the uh, council um, and the system that they're using. I don't know whether or not I'm on 
uh, YouTube or on straight Zoom? Uh, well, I, you're I, actually I think... on both, Mr. Silcox. You're on both. And uh, if your internet is unstable, and that's a whole different topic, um, uh, please leave your video off. It'll it'll help with you. Uh, so if you could just give us your name and uh, your, yes. your name and address, and then car please carry on with your comments. Uh, Bob Silcox, ten thirty seven Christie Point Road, uh, Muskoka Lakes. Uh, that's uh, just off Foots Bay. So <clears throat> I've uh, been a Muskokaite for eighty nine years. Um, and I really respect all the uh, effort that council and planning staff have done, and particularly uh, Friends of Muskoka, the MLA, and uh, many of the speakers today. I've learned quite a bit. I particularly uh, support many of the comments, particularly Paul Richards. Um, <clears throat> the uh, when I read over uh, the current progress uh, of the steering committee and the report that they did, um, I had a lot of questions. Uh, it was difficult to follow uh, the three parcels of land that are under discussion, the Ken Flower lands, or call it Red Leaves and J.W. Marriott, uh, the Mitch Goldhar lands, which are Cleveland's house, marina, the rock golf course, and adjacent land. Uh, that was formerly the freed developments and finally legacy cottages. Uh, <clears throat> the, to boil it down, uh, I think council and uh, most taxpayers in the district uh, favor the environment above all else. And the observation that we, we have a, let's say a welcome owner uh, of the Cleveland's house lands in the name of Mitch Goldhar, he could, we're all expendable, we're all going to die or things are going to change. Own. Uh, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to bear with me. I don't know why I'm getting that call. So, <laughs> but uh, he could wind up selling the land. He could be incapacitated through health uh, and it could pass to another owner. So uh, <laughs> the final um, plan uh, must be pinned down um, appropriately, as pointed out by Nick Mc, Mc, McDonald, uh, there should be a hard cap on the maximum number of docks. Uh, the docks defined measurement wise and what they're used for uh, in the in the entire Minette area. We do have. Uh, I see uh, 60 docks built on the Red Leaves property, uh, 90 are on hold, making 150 uh, potential. Um, so then there are already 120 commercial boat slips in Manette. Uh, and uh, 80% increase could go to 216. Then uh, it was pointed out that the steering committee um, is 20% uh, of the current 120 could go to 144. So in the entire Wallace Bay, Manette area, uh, how many is the in other words, we have to spe spell out what the hard cap is on the number of docks uh, allowed for all three properties or any other. Uh, also, development of this size uh, should have and must have 
uh, municipally run water and sewer system. Uh, that was contemplated for the Red Leaves Resort, but it was, uh, let's say, given a, a break and they didn't uh, go that route. Um, and we, we, it, we have to have a clear cut uh, rules. Uh, the uh, septic, our water system is the most important asset we have in the Muskoka district. And uh, <clears throat> we all know uh, with, uh, oh, rentaling, rent, rented cottagers, uh, non-owners uh, are really uh, quite uh, oblivious to uh, the septic system. They're, they're not cottagers. Uh, so when uh, you have, uh, have cottages rented out, uh, the septic systems must even be checked more carefully by the owners and be inspected by the municipality. For resorts, um, this is a, a must, and it was uh, we we uh, fudged that particular aspect of development. So any further development uh, that must occur. Uh, staff housing, we allowed that to slip by for the JW Marriott, and we can see what the uh, problems have been there. Uh, staff housing on the property should be mandated. Uh, and if uh, it's needed on the Cleveland's House property, it must be part of the deal that staff housing is uh, mandated. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the rules have to be spelled clearly out. Uh, and. Uh, will or must be the words not uh, for consideration or contemplated. Uh, that's uh, about all I have to say. And I thank you, Madam Chair, for your, uh, and, and council for uh, hearing me out. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sil Silcox. Um, any questions, committee? Okay, um, then I think think we're good, Madam, Mr. Stokes. Madam Chair. Madam yes. Chair, just, just one last uh, a thought, and it, this has been mentioned. Peninsula Road and the Fort Sandfield Bridge, there's going, with th this uh, amount of development in Manette, uh, there's going to have to be substantial upgrading uh, <coughs> of these uh, public works. And uh, Council is going to have to deal with how, uh, what the expenses are going to be and what the tax cost is on all of us taxpayers in Muskoka. Uh, that's the other consideration. So docks, uh, water and sewer service, and road bridge infrastructure. Okay, we are, I duly noted. So thank you, Mr. Silcox. And uh, we're going to now move on to our next speaker. And I'm going to, I know it's, it's 12.15, I believe we only have, this is, this may be our last speaker. So um, see if we can maybe wrap this up rather than take a lunch break. Uh, so all I have on my screen is 744752. So I'm not sure who this is yet. Oh, could you turn on your video? Hello? Oh, hello. Um, yes. yes, could you please give us your full name and address before you make your comments? 
Yes, it's Tom LaViolette, and our cottage is on 1020 Hunt Road in Foots Bay on Lake Joseph. And uh, good morning, everyone. I wasn't actually planning on speaking today, but I've been really moved by what I've heard. And um, I just wanted to give a little bit about a little bit about my background. Um, I am the, um, a reti the retired director for the Niagara Parks Botanical Gardens. And um, I was involved in overseeing landscapes with the Parks Commission for many, many years. And I just, I, certain aspects I wanted to mention that um, with this proposed development is that of the, the plants. And the number one thing that I heard earlier was uh, that people wanted to protect was the, the environment. And right now, when I see development happening, I see mature trees come down and I see an attempt by some people to save mature trees. And in order to save mature trees, you need to really protect their root zones. And I have watched development after development that people thought they were saving these mature trees only to see the structures built and in a period of five to 10 to 15 years later, these mature trees start to decline because their root zones were impacted so severely and drainage patterns were changed. So that's, that's one point I wanted to make. The second point was, excuse me, in terms of development, I don't think anybody really wants to see the bones of the development, the buildings. What we want to see is what we enjoy when we boat in Muskoka, and we want to see that those trees, that understory. And to me, that means this development, whatever size it ends up being, requires the planting of thousands of trees, thousands of native trees, thousands of native shrubs that essentially cover up most of the buildings so that people that buy these buildings see the lake through viewpoints, viewpoints only, which when you look from the lake, doesn't look like you're seeing much, but when you're inside the building and you look through a viewpoint, you can see an immense amount. And by doing this, this protects, or shall we say enhances the aesthetic from the lake because it covers up so much of the hard landscape. And some people may disagree with that. That's not what they value. But when I travel through the lakes, I like to see the nature and I like to see as much of it as possible and as little building as possible. And I just see so many cottages being built on the lakes that the trees that have taken hundreds and hundreds of years to grow on thin soils because conifer trees, which is one of our dominant trees, it just takes so long to develop a millimeter of soil on the bedrock that exists. And it's, I, I don't think people realize sometimes, you know, when we take all that away and we scrape off the soil, how long that took for that to originate. So I think that whether it's large trees, native trees, native shrubs, I think that that's the only type of plants that should be allowed. I don't think that we should be allowing plants that are not native if we really want to keep the Muskoka aesthetic and let it really blend in well. Um, I think that's all I wanted to make comment in, in terms of keeping the environment as number one. And I think something can be built here that is aesthetically very natural. I think there are probably some really, really good examples around the world 
Um, but as has been said so many times, we have one time to get this right, one time only. And I think it could be example setting if we can get it right. And Mr. Goldhart, I hope you're listening. Um, and I'm sure you are, but it's, it's those plants and trees that hide it and keep it natural. And um, I, I hope to see that kind of outcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments? All right, so thank you, sir. And we will carry on. I see we have one more speaker. So we will carry on with Mr. Inkster, I believe it is. Well, that doesn't look like Mr. Inkster, but <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome. And if you could give us your full name and address uh, before you make your comments. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Mayor and Councillors. Uh, my name is Pamela Jeffrey, and my husband Norman Inkster and I are at 1388 Peninsula Road. Uh, I'll be brief, uh, as I know that you're looking forward to lunch. Uh, so I'm the great-great-granddaughter of Charles, James, and Fanny Manette, uh, a member of the Manette family. And I just uh, would like to say that I've had the opportunity to speak with Mr. Goldhar and very grateful for the opportunity to do so. And we had a good conversation and my ask of him and my ask of council is as you proceed with development to consider giving a nod to history. The hotel opened in May of 1983. It's a little two-story hotel. Unfortunately, the original family home, Manette Lodge, was lost to uh, snow that accumulated on the roof and the house was, was destroyed. What we have at Cleveland's house is one of the very last of the iconic resort hotels that made Muskoka um, popular and it became a much loved destination for many, many years. And in fact, the very first Manette boats were built on the beach by my great uncle, Bert Manette. So I just wanted to say before you break for lunch that I think we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to give a nod to history with perhaps preservation of just part of the very first hotel with the iconic third story that was added by my great, great grandfather uh, in 1891 in the design of a steamship, which of course was a nod to how everyone was traveling up to Muskoka and making their way along the lakes. That's my only ask and thank you very much for your time. It was great history there, <laughs> must have been. Okay, any, any comments from anyone? No? All right. Well, then, thank you very much, um, Ms. Yeah. Jeffrey. And we've got one more, I believe. Um, if we could bring in, and this is the handle I'm reading, Stray Dog LA. Not quite sure who it is. Hi. Hello there. So if you could give us your, your full name and address, and then please um, carry on. Hi, my name's David Strayton, 100 Tobin Island. And uh, as you can see out the window here, uh, no helicopter port, no uh, old school cottaging. So uh, I guess I believe in the old school and it uh, seems like everybody on this uh, panel is um, really pro-development and uh, I'm anti-development. I'm gonna be the outlier here as well as being a Habs fan. Um, I, uh, I don't think anyone's really gamed out the way development works. And I, I, I don't even think development is a, is a, is a pretty word. And uh, I feel like what's happening is the development is designed to support a sort of a hit and run industry of construction. And then they move on to the next project, which when you're finished with one thing, you now are obliged to green light other projects down the road. So as much as everyone's saying this is uh, 
going to be a unique and one-off opportunity. I believe it's the beginning of a slippery slope. And uh, maybe it won't be the size of Manette, but I feel like we're into a uh, the green lighting of more projects because really the industry that's that's built up around development is the construction industry and they move on after five to six years. And then what's left after that is a bunch of low minimum wage jobs to support this resort or whatever's left of it. So I'm, uh, I, I feel like developers are not responsible for what they build after the fact. I don't feel they're responsible for the roads that go in. I've witnessed it in my own hometown of Venice Beach, California, where they put in Playa del Rey. They put in 30,000 residences on a wetland that people fought hard to preserve. And it's a toilet bowl now. And the roads, the traffic, and uh, that's been a real problem in Venice Beach. And I believe really all we're getting here is a shopping mall with some residences beside it. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, supporter of this. Seems like everybody here is, so I'm going to be the outlier. I think this is going to become another toilet bowl. I know everyone's trying to say the great concessions people have made here. All this guy's like he's gone from 4,000 to 2,000 units. I mean, that's not a concession. Visualize 2,000 units. Someone put up a photo of it. It's insanity. 500 units is insanity. Look at that toilet bowl that's there right now. Um, that. Uh, yeah. Sir, sir, could I could I ask you to sort of stay respectful in how you're speaking? Uh, I believe I have a constitutional right to speak how I want to speak. Or okay, anyway, so so what else would you? What other points would you like to make? That is it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone have any comments or questions? No? Okay, so we're at the end of uh, those who wanted to speak to us today. And I thank everybody for participating. I'm now going to ask I don't Mr. Pink or Mr. McDonald to explain our next steps. Uh, we have now heard our public input. So maybe Mr. McDonald, seeing as you're going to take this all back and work your magic, <laughs> you could uh, help us all understand what, what's next. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Bridgman. This, this meeting has been very, very informative uh, for me, certainly as the planner charged with making recommendations ultimately to this planning committee. So my job over the next little while will be to assemble and make sure I fully understand all of the comments that are being submitted. And as I indicated at the outset of this meeting, all comments will be considered um, and reported on uh, when a report eventually gets prepared to go back to planning committee and council. Uh, we've also got uh, comments from the district of Muskoka as well uh, to consider and other agencies may want to weigh in. So next steps are simply to assess, uh, consider, review uh, and come back in the future with a, uh, a recommendation report. And as I indicated at the outset, I can't tell you what the timing of that report is, uh, but I look forward to diving deep into this and making sure uh, that we end up uh, in a place that, uh, that, that can be supported. The one thing I can say, and, and it reflects upon what I said earlier, I am a, a very big proponent of clarity. Um, and I wanna make sure that whatever gets prepared is as clear as possible to all parties in terms of what is permitted, what can happen, what are the caps on what can happen and what needs to happen if somebody wants to change it. So that is one of my goals, and that's something I'll be working very hard on uh, in a revised official plan amendment uh, that will be brought back to you at some point for consideration. Don't know if Mr. Pink has anything to add to that, uh, but that's what I see the future looking like. Uh, Mr. Pink? Sorry, I see Mayor Harding uh, would like to speak. All right, Mr. Peek, I want to go first. I'm happy to listen to David, and then I'm uh, happy just to chime in after David speaks. Uh, I think David's um, David's not feeling the great need to speak, okay. so go ahead, please. Not a problem. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to Nick and everybody uh, who has presented today. Um, I, obviously, uh, we're here to listen and understand. Um, we, we know 
that there are a number of embedded rights already within this property. Um, and I know people struggle with uh, 2,000 units. Um, I certainly struggle with 4,000 units. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm sitting around this table today. And that's one of the reasons I joined council 10 years ago uh, to be able to uh, help uh, with that area. I, I guess my question to you, Mr. McDonald and or Mr. Pink, understanding that uh, should the developer, or should Mr. Goldhar bring today a, um, a plan that would include 3,000 units, let me say, heaven forbid he decided to add to that, um, because that is the current zoning on the property, that is the current official plan. Uh, when that application is deemed complete, we unfortunately could not be stopping that. Um, so I, I'm anxious to figure out how soon we could get through an amendment uh, and look at this official plan amendment to try and reduce the development rights on this property because uh, you know we talked a year or so ago when the interim control bylaw came off that we were quote unquote exposed um, and the longer this continues to drag on um, 4,000 units um, I might be moving out of Muskoka myself so uh, anyway I will ask that question of Mr. Pink or Mr. McDonald too from a timing as to when we might see the next draft. So Mr. McDonald? Um, thank you, Mayor Harding. I, I certainly recognize the urgency. Uh, there is zoning in place that permits a certain form of development that clearly isn't what people want or are desiring, including, uh, I should add, the current major property owner in the area. Um, so with that being said, I will make every effort uh, to work through the comments received in the next month. And I do anticipate uh, there, there being something coming back to planning committee whether it's an interim report or final, I can't tell you, uh, but I can, I can certainly see August on the horizon for that kind of report. Uh, so I'll commit to that uh, today without talking to Mr. Pink, of course, he may have other ideas on that, uh, but I can certainly see um, moving in that uh, with that timeline. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, I think your hand is up. Uh, it is, thank you, and through you, uh, we're, we're still in open session, correct? As I recall, we haven't moved yes. closed or anything, so I'm we're, a little surprised we're, uh, we're, we're having any discussion at all about the rights of the developer to do things. Uh, I just think we need to be very careful with that. So that is a slippery slope. The other question I want to ask is before uh, Nick and, and uh, crew go back and start to rewrite, it, it, we've, we as a council have heard a heck of a lot over the last couple of weeks and, you know, today as well. Today was sort of the... Uh, icing on the cake. At some point in time, it seems to me uh, that it would be extremely relevant for council to get together and discuss uh, our desires and wishes draft. I mean, at some point in time, this can't just be uh, input from planners. It's got to be input from people who are responsive to the needs of the community. I don't think we've had a chance to give due consideration to what we've heard today. I know I haven't. Uh, I don't think we've had any opportunity to work as a group around other issues that have come out of the uh, draft OPA that's been floated in the public. Uh, and I would think it would be appropriate at some point, maybe after the next draft, maybe before too, uh, to sit down and identify uh, what we think our strategy is going forward and our opportunities for discussion and um, what we'd like to see in the next draft. Uh, I, I, I don't want to delay, but on the other hand, uh, I'm not sure that uh, anybody's going to be able to craft what I think is uh, an appropriate next draft until somebody asks me what I think. And uh, I've heard a lot to think about before I can form an opinion, but I don't think we've, I don't think we've come together around anything yet. Um, well, uh, yes, Councillor Kelly, we're not to come together around anything yet, actually. We needed to have this open meeting uh, and get all of the public input. Uh, legally, we stay open. We, we do not have opinions yet. And so that is the next draft that is coming back. And then maybe if I can put it this way, that's when the hard work is going to start for all of us. That is when we discuss and we are going to come together with what we agree is going to be in this 
this new OPA. So it will be when we get that next draft back. And of course, that will also be an open session. Uh, it'll be a planning committee meeting. And that is when we will start discussing where we're going with this. So is that helpful? That's helpful. Yeah, that's fine. As long as there's some point where we get to intervene, that's fine. Oh, no, this that's our job. That's our next yeah, job. I agree. I agree. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Zavitz. Thank you. It's for you. I, I just want to reflect further on Councillor Kelly's point. Um, it is, I wouldn't say it's a slippery slope, but it certainly um, messes my mind up a little bit to know that folks like the MLA have done a, a, what I think is quite a job uh, to create and, and present a document today that has very solid and actual uh, direction. Um, I, I wouldn't want to be Nick having to, like in Nick's role, to go away and create draft two for us, uh, we the public, uh, we the council to look at, and we the planning committee to look at. How does Nick, um, uh, maybe this is to David, how does Nick dissect through all of the vastness of this information today and insights and uh, come back with a document that, um, so that when I see it, I don't say, well, where's all the MLA comment, you know, which is what happened to a point at the steering committee when it came back and said, Listen, we didn't have consensus. There were many things that we said that weren't baked into this thing. So I, I guess that's a really high level question, but I'm wondering if David could tackle it. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Pink. Thank you, uh, through the chair. I'm happy to, uh, it certainly is a tall task for Mr. McDonald, as, as he has noted, there's a breadth of information and I did want to uh, Stay from the outset, uh, certainly appreciate all the input we have had from the community and everyone who uh, spoke today and who submitted. And certainly Mr. McDonald and I will be going through those. I can speak uh, with Mr. McDonald uh, about potentially uh, having a future discussion on a planning committee meeting uh, for councillors to provide some input or guidance uh, to Mr. McDonald and staff uh, prior to finalizing uh, draft two uh, and a subsequent report with a recommendation. We can certainly look to scheduling that uh, prior to August. Can't speak uh, for Mr. McDonald's timelines, but I think August seems reasonable to me and there will be some planning committee meetings between now and then uh, where perhaps we can have a discussion for council to provide some, some input. Uh, I'd also note uh, that obviously we received a number of large written submissions, uh, not just from the public, but also a number of agencies, uh, department staff, uh, the district of Muskoka, and uh, I will be forwarding that uh, document, a uh, batch of all those submissions to council. Uh, it will be some heavy reading uh, for you. Uh, so I want to give you ample time to, to go through those comments and we can look at scheduling uh, a planning committee meeting discussion at a future date, if that's the wish. Okay, thank you. Um, and I believe Councillor Roberts has a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, um, I, I welcome all those submissions, but as a board of directors, I'm asking that staff produce a synopsis of all points rather than us reading through pages and pages and pages of reports. I was encouraged by uh, Mr. McDonald's um, uh, comment. I may have misinterpreted that he also said that all comments would be considered and I, I think I, I heard um, would be commented on. The only way to do that is to have a synopsis of everything, of all the good points that were made and all the bad, bad points in some people's minds. And then we have a chart on the other side that we can say um, why or not we can go down that route. The, those are my comments and that is my ask. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McDonald, would you like to respond to, to that? Yeah, and, and, and you know, I, I, I have to admit, I kind of skated when the mayor asked when I would be coming back because to some extent, uh, it, it is at your direction that I complete uh, whatever I need to complete. Uh, one path obviously is me going back and thinking about everything and coming back with a recommendation. I don't think that makes sense because input is required from this group of elected officials, clearly. So uh, there is a need for some direction on how the process works from here. I'm not sure how that direction is given uh, and whether it's given in a future meeting or not. 
I have to defer to David, uh, Mr. Pink uh, for that. Uh, but if uh, this committee and council is looking for a synopsis and some initial responses uh, in the form of some kind of report that gets presented at a future committee meeting, I'm very pleased to do that. Uh, just would require that direction. Um, obviously, the, the, the longer it takes for us to go through a process, the longer it takes for there to be a decision point. So I just leave that with you. Uh, but I'm at your beck and call, so to speak, in terms of how you want to proceed. In my view, this is a significant development. And in a normal course, given the scale of this, every comment would be assessed and reviewed and, uh, and responded to in some way uh, from a planning perspective uh, so that you have the benefit of that advice before you make any decisions on process or on whether the OPA should be adopted or not. Um, so again, I'm in your hands as your consultant in terms of what the next steps will be. Okay, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. I, through you to you, I think, uh, Madam Chair, just as a, a potential path forward, we know that in a couple of weeks from now, we're going to be having another planning committee meeting and maybe we leave it for uh, Director Pink uh, Mr. McDonald to have a conversation to try and build a path forward for us to allow some additional public input, or if we need public input, also some council input, um, and they can bring a report back to us, uh, maybe a high level at that next planning meeting. Uh, to Councillor Kelly's comments or concerns about uh, property rights, um, the property rights are the property rights. We can have a discussion about that all day long, and uh, they exist there today. Um, so there's nothing uh, closed session required about that. And again, I think as much as we can do on this whole conversation should be done in open session so that the public fully understand uh, where we're going and why we're going there. Um, so that's my recommendation. Uh, you have a director Pink. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just further to that, uh, it is noted uh, staff support does lay out uh, in your agenda packages uh, very briefly the, the next steps in the process. And it is noted that a, a report will be coming back uh, further to Councillor Roberts. I request that does summarize. Again, I did want to, uh, all of these submissions are addressed to Council, so I do want to forward them in their entirety to you. Uh, however, uh, Mr. McDonald and myself will be producing a summary report that summarizes those comments and provides an analysis to those and they will come back uh, to planning committee uh, with the revised draft. Uh, committee uh, and council can consider whether an additional public meeting is needed. That's still a possibility. We can hear from the public again if there's significant changes to draft two. So that's a future discussion uh, still to be had. Uh, and uh, so I just, uh, again, wanted to lay that out. I think what is uh, somewhat new, uh, perhaps isn't touched on in the report, is we can certainly put uh, a discussion uh, on a future planning committee agenda so that councillors have an opportunity to comment uh, to Mr. McDonald and staff and provide some additional guidance as to your thoughts as to what you heard today and the submissions that you did have time to read. So thank you. So I could ask Mr. McDonald and Mr. Pink, do you think we could have a summary by our next planning committee meeting? Is that realistic, Mr. McDonald? Um, through you, uh, Chair Bridgman, uh, yes, it is. Um, uh, while, while, lots has been, while lots of information has been provided, it, it can be synthesized in a way uh, that we can have a, a fulsome discussion on it. Uh, so uh, I don't think you're expecting me to respond to every individual comment, but there are themes of comments here, such as density, such as height, setbacks, and docking, which we can have a fulsome discussion on at the next planning committee meeting. I don't know what the date of that meeting is, so I'm committing to something I'm not sure about yet, uh, but I think that is doable. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Zavitz. Thank you. One last question um, to you, Chair. So I would imagine we did not vet any speakers today. The public spoke today. We've heard them all. No one got left behind. Good, thank you. No, no, no one, no one was left behind. Uh, okay, so I, I believe, and to everybody who's attended here again, thank you very much. And Paula, thank you for uh, staying on the line and, uh, and everyone else, we have, um, I think we've completed the process to now, and we will be back at planning committee in a couple of weeks. I see Mr. Pink saying something to me, just a sec. 
And in that vein, we are going to have a resolution uh, that will have us uh, uh, recommend this, this comment. So um, it is moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa, be it resolved that the Planning Committee recommend to Township Council that the public and agency comments in regards to the circulation of draft official plan amendment number 56, Resort Village of Manette, be received and that staff be directed to undertake a review and analysis of the public and agency submissions received with a view to providing a revised draft OPA for committee's consideration. Any more discussion? All in favor? Okay, that carries. Sorry? Are we good? Okay. As, as certainly. Um, Mr. Pink would like to make one comment right now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just quickly, again, as Mr. McTuttle noted, he might have been making promises he's unable to keep. Uh, the June planning committee meeting is fast approaching. Uh, just to let committee members know that it may be more realistic uh, to bring that summary report to the July uh, planning committee. Um, so just uh, so that you're aware. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pink. I think if we know we've got it June or July, we're, we're good. So. Uh, so uh, terrific. So, all right. So that um, we have no closed session today. So I am going to read our motion to adjourn. Are we good? Which? Are we good? Oh, uh, Councillor Kelly, are you trying to speak? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm always trying to speak. Yeah, thought, well, no, no, I, I know, I know that. Had, I thought we had, I thought we had closed session after this. No, maybe I'm no. the one who misunderstood. No, it was only if we felt we we uh, we had a need for it. So there is no closed session. To okay, it'll um, be held at a later time. How's that? How's that for later uh, time works? Yeah, later time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we're not we're not negating it completely. We're not, just delaying. Not a not a later time today. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, moved by Councillor Kelly, uh, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa. Be it resolved that the special planning committee meeting adjourn at 1247 p.m. I see we only have p.m. on these planning committee meetings. <laughs> Still. So um, all those in favor? That carries. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. McDonald. Thank you, everyone, for all your participation and hard work. And I 